All right, good evening, everybody. I have been looking forward to this. I oh. have been. I'm also, I have been. I'm also a little nervous um, <laughs> because of technical problems and that, but uh, looks like we've got our quality options. I'm going to need a second to get set up, and then I'm also going to get a few introductory matters out of the way. So, first of all, if you are watching this on YouTube, please keep in mind that this is live. I'm not going to be able to fix errors in the narration. And I actually have some food that's coming to me. Um, and unfortunately, it is late, but I did not want to make my broadcast late. So this does mean that there is going to be a little bit of a break in the, um, in the broadcast. Uh, I also just need to send a quick message to someone. Um, so in addition to the fact that there's going to be a break uh, during the broadcast, <clears throat> um, it, one thing for the live people I should let you know is that there's going to be less audience interaction for the very simple fact that I would ideally like to focus as much as I can on the story. Um, and again, there's the caveat that, you know, I'm going to be interrupted by <clears throat> my need for food. Um, but one unfortunate feature of Twitch is that um, I do not have the ability to restrict the broadcast to uh, specific regions. So I do need to let you know that if you are watching in Spain or in the US, um, I don't have the rights uh, to send it out there. So I have to ask you to exercise your discretion. Um, if you are outside of those territories, uh, the works of Orwell are now in the public domain, which is one of the reasons I can do this. It's actually been in the Canadian public domain for a while, but I know geographically um, my audience has been in a lot of areas where uh, Orwell has not actually been in the public domain. <clears throat> so uh, I am able to control that on um, I am able to control that on um, uh, YouTube a little bit better, I think. But I do need to just get that out of the way. It would help me out because I want to do right by the rights holders. Hey, senior Q, no problem. I'm not actually doing Stellaris tonight. I'm just uh, prepping the. Um, the stream that I am going to be doing today, but I hope you stick around if you've not heard this story. So um, <clears throat> I am conscious of the fact that some of you are just here for the story itself, <clears throat> but there is one last thing that I wanted to uh, get out of the way before we move into the story, um, and that is the reason I'm doing this. Um, there's a lot of people who watch this broadcast who some people haven't heard of George Orwell, uh, and a very large number of people have not read um, some of his most famous works, particularly Animal Farm and 1984. And this is going to be an introduction to a series of things that I'm going to do. And this me will mean that there are some more reading uh, streams coming up. But in this particular case here, I really wanted to get this story out because I think it's a good story. I also think it's an important story. And it's one that I hope uh, you will... Keep in your mind, one, if you just want to hear a good story, um, that's a very good reason to listen to this. But particularly if you are watching this story, um, if you particu particularly if you're watching this because you like my normal broadcast, and if you are coming because of some of the games that I'm going to be playing over the next couple of weeks, I do specifically want you to think about those games in light of the stories that we're going to be uh sort of interacting with. So, without further ado, this is Animal Farm by George Orwell. Chapter 1. Mr. Jones of the Manor Farm had locked the hen houses for the night, but was too drunk to remember to shut the pop holes. With a ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mr. J Mrs. Jones was already snoring. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a stirring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. Word had gone round during the day that Old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream on the previous night and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. Old Major, so he was always called, though the name under which he had been exhibited was Willingdon Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of raised platform, Major was already ensconced on his bed of straw, under a lantern which hung from a beam. 
He was twelve years old, and had lately grown rather stout, but he was still a majestic-looking pig, with a wise and benevolent appearance in spite of the fact that his tushes had never been cut. Before long the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashions. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher, and then the pigs who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched themselves on the window sills, the pigeons fluttered up to the rafters, and the sheep and cows lay down behind the pigs and began to chew the cud. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover had a stout motherly mare, sorry, Clover was a stout motherly mare approaching middle life, who had never quite got her figure back after her fourth foal. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly 18 hands high, and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. A white stripe down his nose gave him a somewhat stupid appearance, and in fact he was not of first-rate intelligence, but he was universally respected for his steadiness of character and tremendous powers of work. After the horses came Muriel, the white goat, and Benjamin, the donkey. Benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm, and the worst-tempered. He seldom talked, and when he did, it was usually to make some cynical remark. For instance, he would say that God had given him a tail to keep the flies off, but that he would sooner have had no tail and no flies. Alone among the animals on the farm, he never laughed. If asked why, he would say that he saw nothing to laugh at. Nevertheless, without openly admitting it, he was devoted to Boxer. The two of them usually spent their Sundays together in a small paddock beyond the orchard, grazing side by side and never speaking. The two horses had just lain down when a brood of ducklings, which had lost their mother, filed into the barn, cheeping feebly and wandering from side to side to find some place where they would not be trodden on. Clover made a sort of wall around them with her great foreleg, and the ducklings nestled down inside it and promptly fell asleep. At the last moment, Molly, the foolish, pretty white mare who drew Mr. Jones's trap, Mr. Jones's trap came mincing daintily in, chewing a, at a lump of sugar. She took a place near the front and began flirting her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was plated with. Last of all came the cat, who looked around, as usual, for the warmest place, and finally squeezed herself in between Boxer and Clover. There she purred contentedly throughout Major's speech, without listening to a word of what he was saying. All the animals were now present except Moses, the tame raven who slept on a perch behind the back door. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began. <clears throat> Comrades, you have already heard about the strange dream that I had last night, but I will come to the dream later. I have something else to say first. I do not think, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months longer, and before I die I feel it is my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. I have had a long life. I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my stall, and I think that I must, may say I understand the nature of life on this earth as well as any animal now living. It is about this that I wish to speak to you. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it. Our lives are miserable, laborious, and short. We are born. We are given just so much food as will keep our, the breath in our bodies, and those of us who are capable of it are forced to work to the last atom of our strength, and the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. But is this simply part of the order of nature? Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? No, comrades. A thousand times no. The soil of England is fertile, its climate good. It is capable of affording food in abundance to enormously greater animals, number of animals than now inhabit it. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that is now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labor is stolen from us by human beings. There, comrades, is the answer to our problems. It is summed up by a single word. Man. Man is the only real enemy we have. Remove man from the scene, and the root cause of hunger and overwork is abolished forever. 
Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow. He cannot run fast enough to catch rabbits. Yet he is lord of all the animals. He sets them to work. He gives back to them the bare minimum that will prevent them from starving, and the rest he keeps for himself. Our labor tills the soil. Our dung fertilizes it. And yet there is not one of us that owns more than his bare skin. You cows I see before me. How many thousands of gallons of milk have you given during this last year? And what has happened to that milk which should have been breeding up sturdy calves? Every drop of it has gone down the throats of our enemies. And you, hens, how many eggs have you laid in the last year? And how many of those eggs ever hatched into chickens? The rest have all gone to market to bring in money for Jones and his men. And you, Clover, where are those four foals you bore? And who should have been the support and pleasure in your old age? Each was sold at a year old. You will never see one of them again. In return for your four confinements and all your labor in the fields, what have you ever had except your bare rations and a stall? And even the miserable lives we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. For myself I do not grumble, for I am one of the lucky ones. I am twelve years old and have had over four hundred children. Such is the natural life of a pig. But no animal escapes the cruel knife in the end. You young porkers who are sitting in front of me, every one of you will scream for your lives at the block within a year. To that horror we all must come. Cows, pigs, hens, sheep, everyone. Even the horses and the dogs have no better fate. You boxer, the very day that those great muscles of yours lose their power, Jones will sell you to the knacker who will cut your throat and boil you down for the foxhounds. As for the dogs, when they grow old and toothless, Jones ties a brick around their necks and drowns them in the nearest pond. Is it not crystal clear then, comrades, that all the evils of this life of ours spring from the tyranny of human beings? Only get rid of man, and the produce of our labor will be our own. Almost overnight we could become rich and free. What then must we do? I work night and day, body and soul, for the overthrow of the human race. That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion! I do not know when that rebellion will come. It might be in a week or in a hundred years. But I know, as surely as I see this straw beneath my feet, that sooner or later justice will be done. Fix your eyes on that, comrades, throughout the short remainder of your lives, and above all, pass on this message of mine to those who will come after you, so that future generations shall carry on the struggle until it is victorious. And remember, comrades, your resolution must never falter. No argument must lead you astray. Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest, that the prosperity of one is the prosperity of the others. It is all lies. Man serves the interests of no creature except himself. And among us animals, let there be perfect unity, perfect comradeship in the struggle. All men are enemies, all animals are comrades. At this moment, there was a tremendous uproar. While Major was speaking, four large rats had crept out of their holes and were sitting on their hindquarters, listening to him. The dogs had suddenly caught sight of them, and it was only by a swift dash to their holes that the rats saved their lives. Major raised his trotter for silence. Comrades, he said, here is a point that must be settled. The wild creatures such as rats and rabbits, are they our friends or our enemies? Let us put it to the vote. I propose this question to the meeting. Are rats comrades? The vote was taken at once, and it was agreed by an overwhelming majority that rats were comrades. There were only four dis dissidents, the three dogs and the cat, who was afterwards discovered to have voted on both sides. Major continued. I have little more to say. I merely repeat, remember always that your duty of enmity towards man and his ways. Whatever goes on upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when you have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed, or wear clothes or drink alcohol or smoke tobacco or touch money or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. Weak or strong, clever or simple, we are all brothers. No animal must ever kill another animal. All animals are equal. 
And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. I cannot describe that dream to you. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. But it reminded me of something that I had long forgotten. Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune and the first three words. <clears throat> I had known that tune in my infancy, but it had long since passed out of my mind. Last night, however, it came back to me in my dream. And what is more, the words of the song also came back. Words, I am certain, which were sung by the animals of long ago and had been lost to memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrades. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beasts of England. The old major cleared his throat and began to sing. As he had said, his voice was hoarse, but he sang well enough, and it was a stirring tune, something between Clementine and Le Cucaracha. The words ran, Beast of England, beast of Ireland, beast of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be your throne, and the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Rings shall vanish from our noses, and the harness from our back. Bit and spur shall rust forever, cruel whips no more shall crack. Riches more the mine can picture, wheat and barley, oats and hay. Clover beans and mangle wurzels shall be ours upon that day. Bright will shine the fields of England, purer shall its waters be. Sweeter yet shall blow its breezes on the day that sets us free. For that day we all must labor, though we die before it break. Cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for freedom's sake. Beast of England, beast of Ireland, beast of every land and clime, hearken well and spread my tidings of the golden future time. The singing of this song threw the animals into the wildest excitement. Almost before Major had reached the end, they had begun singing it for themselves. Even the stupidest of them had already picked up the tune and a few of the words, and, as for the clever ones, such as the pigs and dogs, they had the entire song by heart within a few minutes. And then, after a few preliminary tries, the whole farm burst out into beasts of England in tremendous unison. The cows lowed it, the dogs whined it, the sheep bleated it, the horses whinnied it, and the ducks quacked it. They were so delighted with the song that they sang it right through five times in succession, and might have continued singing it all night if they had not been interrupted. Unfortunately, the uproar awoke Mr. Jones, who sprang out of his bed, making sure that a fo uh, there was not a fox in the yard. He seized the gun, which always stood in the corner of his bedroom, and let fly a charge of number six shot into the darkness. The pellets buried themselves in the wall of the barn, and the meeting broke up hurriedly. Everyone fled to his own sleeping place. The birds jumped onto their perches, the animals settled down into the straw, and the whole farm was asleep in a moment. All right, so I'm in an awkward position here where it looks like my food's going to be arriving within the minute. <clears throat> and the next chapter is about seven pages. So tell you what, I'm going to start reading and then we'll just break when we go to the next one. This will be the, there's going to be this and then one more break and then we'll read the story to the end. Chapter 2. Three nights later, Old Major died peacefully in his sleep. His body was buried at the foot of the orchard. This was early in March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. 
Major speech had given to the more intelligent animals on the farm a completely new outlook on life. They did not know when the rebellion predicted by Major would take place. They had no reason for thinking that it would be within their own lifetime, but they saw clearly that it was their duty to prepare for it. The work of teaching and organizing the others fell naturally upon the pigs, who were generally recognized as being the cleverest of the animals. Preeminent among the pigs were two young boars named Snowball and Napoleon, whom Mr. Jones was breeding up for sale. Napoleon was a large, rather fierce-looking Berkshire boar, and only the only Berkshire on the farm, not much of a talker, but with a reputation for getting his own way. Snowball was a more vivacious pig than Napoleon, quicker in speech and more inventive, but he was not considered to have the same depth of character. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers. The best known among them was a small, fat pig named Squealer, with uh, very round cheeks, twinkling eyes, nimble movements, and a shrill voice. He was a brilliant talker, and when he was arguing some difficult point, he had a way of skipping from side to side and whisking his tail, when somehow very, uh, which was somehow very persuasive. The others said of Squealer that he could turn black into white. These three had elaborated Old Major's teachings into a complete system of thought, to which they gave the name of animalism. Several nights a week, after Mr. Jones was asleep, they held secret meetings in the barn and expounded the principles of animalism to the others. At the beginning, they met with much stupidity and apathy. Some of the animals talked of the duty of loyalty to Mr. Jones, who they referred to as master, or made elementary remarks, such as, Mr. Jones feeds us. If he were gone, we would should starve to death. Others asked questions such as, why should we care what happens when we are dead? Or, if this rebellion is to happen anyway, what difference does it make whether we work for it or not? And the pigs had great difficulty in making them see that this was contrary to the spirit of animalism. The stupidest questions of all were asked by Molly, the white mare. The very first question she asked Snowball was, will there be sugar after the rebellion? No, said Snowball firmly. We have no means of making sugar on this farm. Besides, you do not need sugar. You will have all the oats and hay you want. And shall I be allowed to wear ribbons in my mane? asked Molly. Comrade, said Snowball, those ribbons you are so devoted to are the badge of slavery. Can you not understand that liberty is worth more than ribbons? Molly agreed, but she did not sound very convinced. The pigs had an even harder struggle to counteract the lies put about by Moses, the tame raven. Moses, who was Mr. Jones' special pet, was a spy and a tale-bearer, but he was also a clever talker. He claimed to know the existence of a mysterious country called Sugar Candy Mountain, to which all animals went when they died. It was situated somewhere up in the sky, a little distance beyond the clouds. Moses said in Sugar Candy Mountain it was Sunday, seven days a week. Clover was in season all year round, and lump sugar and linseed cake grew on the hedges. The animals hated Moses because he told tales and did no work, but some of them believed in Sugar Candy Mountain, and the pigs had to argue very hard to persuade them that there was no such place. Their most, fa most faithful disciples were the two cart horses, Boxer and Clover. These two had great difficulty in thinking anything out for themselves, but, having once accepted the pigs as their teachers, they absorbed everything that they were told and passed it to the other animals by simple arguments. They were unfailing in their attendance at the secret meetings in the barn and led the singing of Beasts of England, which, uh, with which the meetings always ended. Now, I'm going to just take a second here and get my food. I apologize for the break. I'm going to try and make it as short as I can, but I'm also going to get some water so we can go through to the end. I'll be back as soon as I can.
All right, I apologize for the break. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier than it, more easily than anybody had expected. In the past years, Mr. Jones, although a hard master, had been a capable farmer, but of late he had fallen on evil days. He'd become much disheartened after losing money in a lawsuit, and he had taken to drinking more than was good for him. For whole days at a time, he would lounge in the Windsor chair in the kitchen, reading the newspapers, drinking, and occasionally feeding Moses on crusts of bread soaked in beer. His men were idle and dishonest. The fields were full of weeds, the buildings wanted roofing, the hedges were neglected, and the animals were underfed. June came, and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, which was a Sunday, oh, sorry, Saturday, Mr. Jones went into Willingdon and got so drunk at the Red Lion that he did not come back until midday on Sunday. The men had milked the cows in the early morning and then had gone out rabbiting without bothering to feed the animals. When Mr. Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep on the drawing room sofa with the news of the world over his face, so that when evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last they could stand it no longer. One of the cows broke in the door of the store shed with her horn, and all the animals began to help themselves from the bins. It was just then that Mr. Jones woke up. The next moment, he and his four men were in the store shed with whips in their hands, lashing out in all directions. This was more than the hungry animals could bear. With one accord, though nothing of this kind had ever been planned beforehand, they flung themselves upon their tormentors. Jones and his men suddenly found themselves being butted and kicked from all sides. The situation was quite out of their control. They had never seen animals behave like this before, and this sudden uprising of creatures whom they were used to thrashing and maltreating just as they chose frightened them almost out of their wits. After only a moment or two, they gave up trying to defend themselves and took their, to their heels. A minute later, all five of them were in full flight down the cart track that led to the main road, with the animals pursuing them in triumph. Mr. Mrs. Jones look out, looked out the bedroom window, saw what was happening, hurriedly flung a few possessions into a carpet bag, and slipped out of the farm by another way. <clears throat> Moses sprang off his perch and flapped after her, croaking loudly. Meanwhile, the animals had chased, uh, had chased Jones and his men out onto the road and slammed the five-barred gate behind them. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had successfully carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. For the first few minutes, the animals could hardly believe their good fortune. Their first act was to gallop in a body right around the boundaries of the farm, as though to make quite sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it, and then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated reign. The harness room at the end of the stables was broken open, the bits, the noose rings, the dog chains, the cruel knives with which Mr. Jones had been, had been used to castrate the pigs and lambs were all flung down the well. The reins, the halters, the blinkers, the degrading nose bags were thrown into the rubbish fire which was burning in the yard. So were the whips. All the animals capered with joy when they saw the whips going up in flames. Snowball also threw onto the fire the ribbons with which the horses' manes and tails had usually been decorated on market days. Ribbons, he said, should be considered as clothes which were the mark of a human being. All animals should go naked. When Boxer heard this, he fetched the small straw hat which he wore in summer to keep the flies out of his ears and flung it onto the fire with the rest. In a very little while, the animals had destroyed everything that reminded them of Mr. Jones. Napoleon then led them back to the storeroom shed and served out a double ration of corn for everybody, with two biscuits for each dog. Then they sang Beasts of England from end to end seven times running, and after that they settled down for the night and slept as they had never slept before. But they woke at dawn as usual, and suddenly remembered the glorious thing that had happened, and they all raced out into the pasture together. A little way down the pasture there was a knoll that commanded a view of most of the farm. The animals rushed to the top of it and gazed around them in the clear morning light. Yes, it was theirs. Everything that they could see was theirs. In the ecstasy of that thought, they gambled around and around. They hurled themselves into the air in great leaps of excitement. They rolled in the dew. They cropped mouthfuls of the sweet summer grass, they kicked up clods of the black earth and snuffed its rich scents. And then they made a tour inspection of the whole farm and surveyed with speechless admiration the plowland, the hayfield, the orchard, the pool, the spinney. 
It was as though they had never seen these things before, and even now they could hardly believe that it was all their own. They filed back into the farm building and halted in silence outside the door of the farmhouse. That was theirs too, and they were fright but they were frightened to go inside. After a moment, however, Snowball and Napoleon butted the door open with their shoulders, and the animals entered in single file, walking with the utmost care for fear of disturbing anything. They tiptoed from room to room, afraid to speak above a whisper and gazing with a kind of awe at the unbelievable luxury, at the beds with their feather mattresses, the looking glasses, the horsehair sofa, the Brussels carpet, the lithograph of Queen Victoria over the drawing room mantelpiece. They were just coming down the stairs when Molly was discovered to be missing. Going back, the others had found that she remained behind in the best bedroom. She had taken a piece of blue ribbon from Mrs. Jones' dressing table and was holding it against her shoulder and admiring herself in the glass in a very foolish manner. The others reproached her sharply, and she went outside. Some hams hanging in the kitchen were taken out for burial, and the barrel of beer in the scullery was stove in with a kick from Boxer's hoof. Otherwise, nothing in the house was touched. A unanimous resolution was passed on the spot that the farmhouse should be preserved as a museum. All were agreed that no animal must ever live there. <clears throat> the animals had their breakfast, and then Snowball and Napoleon called them together again. Comrades, said Snowball, it is half past six, and we have a long day before us. Today we must begin the hay harvest, but there is another matter that must be attended to first. The pigs now revealed that during the past three months they had taught themselves to read and write from an old spelling book which had belonged to Mr. Jones's children, and which had been thrown on the rubbish heap. Napoleon sent for pots of black and white paint, and led the way down to the five-barred bar gate that gave, <clears throat> that gave on the main road. Then Snowball, for it was Snowball who was the best at writing, took a brush between two knuckles of his trotter and painted out Manor Farm from the top bar of the gate, and in its place painted Animal Farm. This was to be the name of the farm from now onwards. After this, they went back to the farm buildings, where Snowball and Napoleon sent for a ladder, which they caused to be set against the end of the wall of the big barn. They explained that by their studies of the past three months, the pigs had succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. The seven commandments would now be inscribed on the wall, and they would form an unalterable law by which all of the animals on Animal Farm must live forever after. With some difficulty, for it is not easy for a pig to balance himself on a ladder, Snowball climbed up and set to work, with Squealer a few rungs below him holding the paint pot. The commandments were written out on a tarred wall with great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. They ran thus. 1. Whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. 2. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. 3. No animal shall wear clothes. 4. No animal shall sleep in a bed. <clears throat> 5. No animal shall drink alcohol. 6. No animal shall kill any other animal. 7. All animals are equal. It was very neatly written, and except that friend was written F-R-E-I-N-D, and one of the S's was the wrong way around, the spelling was correct all the way through. Snowball read it aloud for the benefit of the others. All the animals nodded in complete agreement, and the cleverer ones once began, uh, at once began to learn the commandments by heart. Now, comrades, cried Snowball, throwing down the paintbrush, to the hayfield. Let us make a point of honor to get in the harvest more quickly than Jones and his men could do. But at this moment, the three cows, who had seemed uneasy for some time past, set up a loud lowing. They had not been milked in 24 hours, and their udders were almost bursting. After a little thought, the pigs sent for buckets and milked the cows fairly successfully, their trotters being well adapted to this task. Soon there were five buckets of frothing, creamy milk, with which the animals looked at with considerable interest. What's going to happen to that, all that milk? said someone. Joe's used sometimes to mix some of it in our mash, said one of the hens. Never mind the milk, comrades, cried Napoleon, placing himself in front of the buckets. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball will lead the way. I shall follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrades. The hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield to begin the harvest, and when they came back in the evening, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. <clears throat> Chapter 3 
how they toiled and sweated to get the hay in, but their efforts were rewarded, for the harvest was an even bigger success than they had hoped. Sometimes the work was hard, the implements had been designed for human beings and not for animals, and it was a great drawback that no animal was able to use any tool that involved standing on his hind legs. But the pigs were so clever that they could think of a way around every difficulty. As for the horses, they knew every inch of the field, and in fact understood the business of mowing and raking far better than Jones and his men had ever done. The pigs did not actually work, but directed and supervised the others. With their superior knowledge, it was natural that they should assume the leadership. Boxer and Clover would harness themselves to the cutter or the horse rake. No bits or reins were needed in these days, of course. And tramp steadily around and round the field with a pig walking behind them, calling, Gee up, comrade, or Whoa back, comrade, as the case may be. And every animal down to the humblest worked at turning the hay and gathering it. Even the ducks and hens toiled to and fro all day in the sun, carrying tiny wisps of hay in their beaks. In the end, they finished the harvest in two days less time than it had usually taken Jones and his men. Moreover, it was the biggest harvest that the farm had ever seen. There was no wastage whatever. The hens and the ducks, with their sharp eyes, had gathered, gathered up every last stalk, and not an animal on the farm had stolen so much as a mouthful. All through that summer, the work on the farm went like clockwork. The animals were happy as they had, as <clears throat> the animals were happy as they had never conceived it possible to be. Every mouthful of food was an acute, positive pleasure, now that it was truly their own food produced by themselves and for themselves, not doled out to them by some grudging master. With the worthless, parasitical human beings gone, there was more for everyone to eat. There was more leisure, too, an experience though the animals were. They met with many difficulties. <clears throat> Sorry. They met with many difficulties. For instance, later in the year, when they harvested the corn, they had to tread it out in the ancient style and blow away the chaff with their breath, since the farm possessed no threshing machine. But the pigs, with their cleverness, and Boxer, with his tremendous muscles, always pulled them through. Boxer was the admiration of everybody. He had been a hard worker even in Joan's time, but now he seemed more like three horses than one. There were days when the entire work of the farm seemed to rest upon his mighty shoulders. From morning to night, he was pushing and pulling, always at the spot where the work was hardest. He had made an arrangement with one of the cockerels to call him in the morning a half hour earlier than everyone else, and he would put in some volunteer labor at whatever seemed to be most needed before the regular day's work began. His answer to every problem, every setback, was, I will work harder, which he adopted as his personal motto. But everyone worked according to his capacity. The hens and ducks, for instance, saved five bushels of corn at the harvest by gathering up the stray grains. Nobody stole, nobody grumbled over his rations. The quarreling and biting and jealousy that had been normal features of life in the old days had almost disappeared. Nobody shirked, or almost nobody. Molly, it was true, was no good at getting up in the mornings, and had a way of leaving work early on the ground that there was a stone in her hoof. And the behavior of the cat was somewhat peculiar. It was soon noticed that she, when there was work to be done, the cat could never be found. She would vanish for hours on end, and then reappear at mealtimes, or in the evening after the work was over, as though nothing had happened. But she always made such excellent excuses, and purred so affectionately, that it was impossible not to believe in her good attentions. Old Benjamin the donkey seemed quite unchanged since the rebellion. He did his work in the same slow, obstinate way that he had always done it in Jones's time, never shirking and never volunteering for extra work either. About the rebellion and its re results, he would express no opinion. When asked whether he was not happier now than uh, that Jones was gone, he would say only, Donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. And the others had to be content with this cryptic answer. On Sundays, there was no work. Breakfast was an hour later than usual, and after breakfast, there was a ceremony which was observed every week without fail. First came the hoisting of the flag. Snowball had found it in the harness room, an old green tablecloth of Mrs. Jones, and had painted on it a hoof and a horn in white. This was run up the flagstaff in the farmhouse garden every Sunday morning. The flag was green, Snowball explained, to represent the green fields of England, while the hoof and the horn signified the future republic of animals which would arise when the human race had finally been overthrown. After the hoisting of the flag, the animals trooped into the big barn for a general assembly which was known as the meeting. Here the work of the coming week was planned out and resolutions were put forward and debated. It was always the pigs who put forward the resolutions. The other animals understood how to vote, 
but could never think of any resolutions of their own. Snowball and Napoleon were by far the most active in the debates. But it was noticed that these two were never in agreement. Whatever suggestion either of them made, the other could be counted on to oppose it. Even when it was resolved, a thing that no one could object to in itself, to set aside a small paddock behind the orchard as a home of rest for animals who were past work, there was a stormy debate over the correct retiring age for each class of animal. The meeting always ended with singing of beasts of England, and the afternoon was given up to recreation. The pigs had set aside the harness room as a headquarters for themselves. Here in the evenings, they studied blacksmithing, carpentering, and other necessary arts from books which they had brought out of the farmhouse. Snowball also busied himself with organizing the other animals into what he called animal committees. He was indefatigable at this. He formed the egg production committee for the hens, the clean tails league for the, ta- the cows, the wild comrades re-education committee, the object of this was to tame the rats and rabbits, and the whiter wool movement for the sheep and various others besides instituting classes in reading and writing. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The attempt to tame the wild creatures, for instance, broke down almost immediately. They continued to behave very much as before, and when treated with generosity, they took advantage of it. The cat joined the re-education committee and was very active in it some days. She was seen one day sitting on the roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all animals were now comrades and that any sparrow who chose could come and perch on her paw, but the sparrows kept their distance. The reading and writing classes, however, were a great success. By the autumn, almost every animal on the farm was literate to some degree. As for the pigs, they could already read and write perfectly. The dogs learned to read fairly well, but were not interested in reading anything except the Seven Commandments. Muriel the goat could read somewhat better than the dogs, and perhaps uh, sometimes used to read to the others in the evenings from scraps of newspaper which she found on the rubbish heap. Benjamin could read as well as any pig, but never exercised his faculty. So far as he knew, he said, there was nothing worth reading. Clover learnt the whole alphabet, but could not put the words together. Boxer could not get beyond the letter D. He would trace out A, B, C, D in the dust with his great hoof, and then he would stand staring at the letters with his ear back, ears back, sometimes shaking his forelock, trying with all of his might to remember what came next and never succeeding. On several occasions, indeed, he did learn E, F, G, H, but by the time he knew them, it was always discovered that he had forgotten A, B, C, and D. Finally, he decided to be content with the first four letters and used to write them out once or twice every day to refresh his memory. Molly refused to learn any but the five letters which spelled her own name. She would form these very neatly out of pieces of twig and would then decorate them with flower, a flower or two and walk around them admiring them. None of the other animals on the farm could get further than the letter A. It was also found that the stupider animals, such as the sheep, hens, and ducks, were unable to learn the Seven Commandments by heart. After much thought, Snowball declared that the Seven Commandments could, in effect, be reduced to the single maxim, namely, four legs good, two legs bad. This, he said, contained the essential principle of animalism. Whoever had thoroughly grasped it would be safe from human influences. The birds at first objected, since it seemed that they also had two legs, but Snowball proved to them that this was not so. A bird's wing, comrades, he said, is an organ of propulsion and not manipulation. It should, therefore, be regarded as a leg. The distinguishing mark of man is the hand, the instrument with which he does all of his mischief. The birds did not understand Snowball's long words, but they accepted his explanation, and all the humbler animals set to work to learn the new maximum by heart. Four legs good, two legs bad, was inscribed at the end of the wall on the barn, above the Seven Commandments and in bigger letters. When they had once got it by heart, the sheep developed a great liking for this maxim, and often they lay in the field, as they lay in the fields, they would start bleeding. Four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, and keep it up for hours and hours on end, never growing tired of it. Napoleon took no interest in Snowball's committees. He said that the education of the young was more important than anything that could be done for those who had already grown up. It happened that Jesse and Bluebell had both whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth between them to nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they were weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mothers, saying that he would make himself responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft, which could only be reached by a ladder from the harness room, 
and there he kept them in such seclusion that the rest of the farm soon forgot their existence. The mystery of where the milk went was soon cleared up. It was mixed every day into the pig's mash. The early apples were now ripening, and the grass of the orchard was littered with windfalls. The animals had assumed as a matter of course that these would be shared out equally. One day, however, the order went forth that the windfalls were to be collected and brought to the harness room for the use of the pigs. At this, some of the other animals murmured, uh, murmured, but it was of no use. All the pigs were in full agreement on this point, even Snowball and Napoleon. Squealer was sent to make the necessary explanation to the others. Comrades, he cried, you do not imagine, I hope, that the pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole object in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. The whole management and organization of this farm depend on us. Day and night we are watching over your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty? Jones would come back. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, cried Squealer, almost pleadingly, skipping from side to side, to side and whisking his tail. Surely there was no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. Now, if there was one thing that the animals were completely certain of, it was that they did not want Jones back. When it was put to them in this light, they had no more to say. The importance of keeping the pigs in good health was too obvious. So it was agreed without further argument that the milk and the windfall apples, and also the main crop of apples when they ripened, should be reserved for the pigs alone. <clears throat> Chapter 4 By the late summer, the news of what had happened on Animal Farm had spread across half the country. Every day, Snowball and Napoleon set out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals on neighboring farms, tell them the story of the rebellion, and teach them the tune of Beasts of England. Most of this time, Mr. Jones had, been spent, had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at Willingdon, complaining to anyone who would listen of the monstrous injustice he had suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not at first give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could or not somehow turn Jones's misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm, much overgrown by woodland, with all of its pastures worn out and its hedges in a disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Pilkington, was an easy-going gentleman farmer who spent most of his time in fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm, which was called Pitchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough shrewd man perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement even in the defense of their own interests. Nevertheless, they were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm, and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first they pretended to laugh, to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight, they said. They put it about that the animals on Manor Farm, they insisted on calling it Manor Farm, they would not tolerate the name Animal Farm, were perpetually fighting among themselves and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pilkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals there practiced cannibalism, tortured one another with red-hot horseshoes, and had their females in common. This was what came of rebelling against the laws of nature, Frederick and Pilkington said. However, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm, where the human beings had been turned out and the animals managed their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms, and throughout that year a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been tra tractable, suddenly turned savage. Sheep broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked the pail over. Hunters refused the, uh, their fences <clears throat> and shot their riders onto the other side. Above all, the tune and even the words of Beasts of England were known everywhere. It had spread with astonishing speed. 
The human beings could not contain their rage when they heard this song, but they pretended to think that it was merely ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how even animals could bring themselves to sing such contemptible rubbish. Any animal caught singing it was giving a flogging on the spot. And yet, the song was irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled it in the hedges, the pigeons cooted in the elms. It had gone into the din of the smithies and the tune of the church bells. And when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. Early in October, when the corn was cut and stacked and some of it was already threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air, alighted in the yard of Animal Farm with the wildest excitement. Jones and all his men, with a half dozen others from Foxwood and Pitchfield, had entered the five-barred gate and were coming up the cart track that led to the farm. They were all carrying sticks, except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. Obviously, they were going to attempt the recapture of the farm. This had long been expected, and all preparation had been made. Snowball, who studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defensive operations. He gave his orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm buildings, Snowball launched his first attack. All of the pigeons, to the number of 35, to and fro over the men's head, uh, sorry, flew to and fro over the men's heads and dropped their dung on them from midair. While the men were dealing with this, the geese, who had previously been hiding from behind the hedge, rushed out and pecked viciously at the calves of their legs. However, this was only a light skirmishing maneuver intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep with Snowball at the head of them rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned around and lashed at them with his small hooves. But once again the men, with their sticks and their hobnailed boots, were too strong for them, and suddenly at a squeal from Snowball, which was the signal for retreat, the animals turned and fled through the gateway into the yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were well inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows, and the rest of the pigs, who had been lying in ambush in the cowshed, suddenly emerged from their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave the signal for a charge. He himself dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw him coming, raised his gun, and fired. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and the sheep, a sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his fifteen stone against Jones's legs. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung, and his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying specter of all was Boxer, rearing up on his hind legs and striking out with his great iron-shod hooves like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood on the skull and stretched him lifeless in the mud. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment all the animals together were chasing them around and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, beaten, and trampled on. There was not an animal on the farm that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly leapt off a roof onto a cowman's shoulders and sank her claws in his neck, at which he yelled horribly. At a moment when the opening was clear, the men were glad enough to rush out of the yard and make a bolt for the main road. And so within five minutes of their invasion, they were, in 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 they were in ignominious retreat by the same way that they had come, with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at the stable lad who lay face down in the mud, trying to turn him over. The boy did not stir. He's dead, said Boxer sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from these, whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take a life, not even a human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. Where's Molly? exclaimed somebody. Molly, in fact, was missing. For a moment, there was a great alarm. It was feared that the men might have harmed her in some way or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in her stall with her head buried among the hay in the manger. She had taken flight as soon as the gun went off and the others came back from looking for her. It was to find that the stable lad, who in fact was only stunned, had already recovered and made off. The animals had now resembled in, reassembled in the wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits at the battle at the top of his voice. An impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately. 
The flag was run up, and Beasts of England was sung a number of times, and then the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, a hawthorn bush being planted on her grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech, emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for Animal Farm if need be. The animals decided unanimously to create a decoration, Animal Hero, First Class, which was conferred then and there on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal, they were really some old horse brasses which had been found in the harness room, to be worn on Sundays and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which was conferred posthumously on the dead sheep. There was much discussion as to what the battle should be called. In the end, it was named the Battle of the Cowshed, since that is where the ambush had been sprung. Mr. Jones's gun had been found lying in the mud, and it was known that there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse. It was decided to set the gun up at the foot of the flagstaff like a piece of artillery, and to fire it twice a year, once on October the 12th, the anniversary of the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer Day, the anniversary of the Rebellion. Chapter 5 as winter drew on, Molly became more and more troublesome. She was late for work every morning, and excused herself by saying that she overslept, and she complained of mysterious pains, though her appetite was excellent. On every kind of pretext, she would run away from work and go to the drinking pool, where she would stand foolishly gazing at her own reflection in the water. But there were also rumors of something more serious. One day, as Molly strolled blithely, blithely into the yard, flirting her long tail and chewing at a stalk of hay, Clover took her aside. <clears throat> Molly, she said, I have something very serious to say to you. This morning, I saw you looking over the hedge that divides Animal Farm from Foxwood. One of Mr. Pilkington's men was standing on the other side of the hedge. And I was a long way away, but I'm almost certain I saw this. He was talking to you, and you were allowing him to stroke your nose. What does that mean, Molly? He didn't. I wasn't. It, it isn't true cried Molly, beginning to prance around and paw the ground. Molly, look me in the face. Do you give me your word of honor that that man was not stroking your nose? It isn't true, repeated Molly, but she could not look Clover in the face, and the next moment she took to her heels and galloped away into the field. A thought struck Clover. Without saying anything to the others, she went to Molly's stall and turned over the straw with her hoof. Hidden under the straw was a little pile of lump sugar and several bunches of ribber, ribbon of different colors. <clears throat> Three days later, Molly disappeared. For some weeks, nothing was known of her whereabouts. Then the pigeons reported that they had seen her on the other side of Willingdon. She was between the shafts of a smart dog cart painted red and black, which was standing outside a public house. A fat, red-faced man in cheek breeches and gaiters, who looked like a publican, was stroking her nose and feeding her with sugar. Her coat was newly clipped, and she wore a scarlet ribbon along, around her forelock. She appeared to be enjoying herself, so the pigeon said. None of the animals ever mentioned Molly again. In January, there, came a bitterly hard we there became a bitterly hard weather. The earth was like iron, and nothing could be done in the fields. Many meetings were held in the big barn, and the pigs occupied themselves with planning out the work of the coming season. It had come to be accepted that the pigs, who were manifestly cleverer than the other animals, should decide all questions of farm policy, though their decisions had to be ratified by a majority vote. This arrangement would have worked well enough had it not been for the disputes between Snowball and Napoleon. These two disagreed at every point where disagreement was possible. If one of them suggested sowing a bigger acreage of barley, the other was certain to demand a bigger acreage of oats, and if one of them said that such a field was just right for cabbages, the other would declare that it was useless for anything except roots. Each had his own following, and there were some violent debates. At the meeting, Snowball often won the majority by his brilliant speeches, but Napoleon was better at canvassing support for himself in between times. He had been especially successful with the sheep. Of late, the sheep had taken to bleeding, Four legs good, two legs bad, both in and out of a season and they often interrupted the meeting with this. It was noticed that they were especially liable to break into four legs good, two legs bad, at crucial moments in Snowball's speeches. Snowball had made a close study of some back numbers of farmer and stock breeder, which he had found in the farmhouse, and was full of plans for innovations and improvements. He talked learnedly about field drains, silage, and basic slag, 
and worked out a complicated scheme for all the animals to drop their dung directly in the fields, each at a different spot every day to save on the lab uh, labor of cartage. Napoleon produced no schemes of his own, but said quietly that snowballs would come to nothing, and seemed to be biding his time. But of all their controversies, none was so bitter as the one that took place over the windmill. In the long pasture, not far from the farm buildings, there was a small knoll, which was the highest point on the farm. After surveying the ground, Snowball declared that this was just the place for a windmill, which could be made to operate a dynamo and supply the farm with electrical power. This would light the stalls and warm them in winter, and would also run a circular saw, a chaff cutter, a mangle slicer, and an electric milking machine. The animals had never heard of anything of this kind before, for the farm was an old-fashioned one, and had only the most primitive machinery. And they listened in astonishment while Snowball conjured up pictures of fantastic machines which would do their work for them while they grazed at their ease in the fields or improved their minds with reading and conversation. Within a few weeks, Snowball's plans for the windmill were fully worked out. The mechanical details came mostly out of three books which had belonged to Mr. Jones. One Thousand Useful Things to Do About the House, Every Man His Own Bricklayer, and Electricity for Beginners. Snowball used, his study, uh, used as his study a shed which had once been used for incubators and had a smooth wooden floor suitable for drawing on. He was closeted there for hours at a time, with his books held open by a stone and a piece of chalk gripped between the knuckles of his trotter. He would move rapidly to and fro, drawing in line after line and uttering little whimpers of excitement. Gradually the plans grew into a complicated mass of cranks and cogwheels, covering more than half the floor, with the other animal, which the other animals found completely unintelligible but very impressive. All of them came to look at Snowball's drawings, at least once a day. Even the hens and ducks came, and were at pains not to tread on the chalk, uh, the chalk marks. <clears throat> Only if Napoleon held aloof. He declared himself against the windmill from the start. One day, however, he arrived unexpectedly to examine the plans. He walked heavily around the shed, looked closely at every detail of the plans, and snuffed at them once or twice, then stood for a little while contemplating them and out of the, uh, out of the corner of his eye, and then suddenly he lifted his leg, urinated over the plans, and walked out without uttering a word. The whole farm was deeply divided on the subject of the windmill. Snowball did not deny, deny that to build it would be a difficult business. Stone would have to be quarried and built up into walls, and the sails would have to be made, and then there would have to be the need for dynamos and cables. How these were to be procured, Snowball did not say. But he maintained that this could all be done in a year, and thereafter, he declared, so much labor would be saved that the animals would only need to work three days a week. Napoleon, on the other hand, argued that the great need of the moment was to increase food production, and that if they wasted time on the windmill, they would all starve to death. The animals formed themselves into two factions under the slogan, Vote for Snowball and the Three-Day Week, and Vote for Napoleon and the Full Manger. Benjamin was the only animal who did not side with either faction. He refused to believe that food would become more plentiful or that the windmill would save work. Windmill or no windmill, he said, life would go on as it had always gone on. That is, badly. Apart from the disputes over the windmill, there was the question about the defense of the farm. It was fully realized that though the human beings might have been defeated in the Battle of the Cowshed, they might make another, more determined attempt to recapture the farm and reinstate Mr. Jones. They had all the more reason for doing so because the news of their defeat had spread across the countryside and had made the animals on the neighboring farms more restive than ever. As usual, Snowball and Napoleon were in disagreement. According to Napoleon, what the animals must do was procure firearms and train themselves in the use of them. According to Snowball, they must send out more and more pigeons to stir up rebellion among the animals on the other farms. The one argued that if they could not defend themselves, they were bound to be conquered. The other argued that if rebellions happened everywhere, they would have no need to defend themselves. The animals listened first to Napoleon, and then Snowball, and could not make up their minds which was right. Indeed, they always found themselves in agreement with the one who was speaking at the moment. At last the day came when Snowball's plans were completed. At the meeting on the following Sunday, the question of whether or not to begin work on the windmill was to be put to the vote. When the animals assembled in the big barn, Snowball stood up, and though occasionally interrupted by bleedings from the sheep, set forth his reasons for advocating the building of the windmill. Then Napoleon stood up to reply. He said very quietly that the windmill was nonsense, and that he advised nobody to vote for it, 
and promptly sat down again. He had spoken for barely thirty seconds, and seemed almost indifferent as to the effect that he produced. At this, Snowball sprang to his feet, and shouting down the sheep who had begun bleeding again, broke into a passionate appeal in favor for his windmill. Until now, the animals had been about equally divided in their sympathies, but in a moment, Snowball's eloquence had carried them away. In glowing sentences, he painted a picture of animal form as it might be when sordid labor was lifted from animals' backs. His imagination had now run far beyond chaff cutters and turnip slicers. Electricity, he said, could operate threshing machines, plows, harrows, rollers, and reapers, and binders, besides supplying every stall with its own electric light, hot and cold water, and an electric heater. By the time that he had finished speaking, there was no doubt as to which way the vote would go. But just at this moment, Napoleon stood up and, casting a peculiar sidelong look at Snowball, uttered a high-pitched whimper of a kind that no one had heard him utter before. <clears throat> at this, there was a terrible baying sound outside, and nine enormous dogs wearing brass-studded collars came bounding into the barn. They dashed straight for Snowball, who only sprang from his place just in time to escape their snapping jaws. In a moment, he was out the door, and they were after him. Too amazed and frightened to speak, the animals crowded through the door to watch the chase. Snowball was racing across the long pasture that led to the road. He was running as only a pig can run, but the dogs were close on his heels. Suddenly he slipped, and it seemed certain that they had him. Then he was up again, running faster than ever. Then the dogs were gaining on him again. One of them all but closed his jaws on Snowball's tail, but Snowball whisked it free just in time. Then he put on an extra spurt, and with a few inches to spare, he slipped through a hole in a hedge and was seen no more. Silent and terrified, the animals crept back into the barn. In a moment, the dogs came bounding back. At first, no one had been able to imagine where these creatures came from, but the problem was soon solved. They were the puppies whom Napoleon had taken away from their mothers and reared privately. Though not yet full-grown, they were huge dogs and as fierce-looking as wolves. They kept close to Napoleon. It was noticed they wagged their tails to him in the same way as the other dogs had been used to, used to do to Mr. Jones. Napoleon, with the dogs following him, now mounted onto the raised portion of the floor where Major had previously stood to deliver his speech. He announced that from now on the Sunday morning meetings would come to an end. They were unnecessary, he said, and wasted time. In future, all questions related to the working of the farm would be settled by a special committee of pigs presided over by himself. They would meet in private, and afterwards communicate their decisions to the others. The animals would still assemble on Sunday mornings to salute the flag, sing Beasts of England, and receive their orders for the week, but there would be no more debates. In spite of the shock that Snowball's expulsion had given them, the animals were dismayed by this announcement. Several of them would have protested had they had found the right arguments. Even Boxer was vaguely troubled. He set his ears back, shook his forelock several times, and tried hard to marshal his thoughts, but in the end he could not think of anything to say. Some of the pigs themselves, however, were more articulate. Four young porkers in the front row uttered shrill squeaks of disapproval, and all four of them sprang to their feet and began speaking at once. But suddenly the dogs sitting around Napoleon let out deep, menacing growls, and the pigs fell silent and sat down again. Then the sheep broke out in a tremendous bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for nearly a quarter of an hour and put an end to any chance of discussion. Afterwards, Squealer was sent around the farm to explain the new arrangements to the others. Comrades, he said, I trust that every animal here appreciates the sacrifice that Comrade Napoleon has made in taking this extra labor upon himself. Do not imagine, comrades, that leadership is a pleasure. On the contrary, it has a deep and heavy responsibility. No one believes more firmly than Comrade Napoleon that all animals are equal. He would be only too happy to let you make decisions for yourselves, but sometimes you might make the wrong decisions, comrades. And then where would you be? Suppose you had decided to follow Snowball with his moonshine of windmills. Snowball, who, as we know, is no better th excuse me, than a criminal. He fought bravely at the Battle of Cowshed, said somebody. Bravery is not enough, said Squealer. Loyalty and obedience are more important. And as to the Battle of the Cowshed, I believe the time will come when we shall find that Snowball's part in it was much exaggerated. Discipline, comrades. Iron discipline. That is the watchword for today. One false step, and our enemies will be upon us. Surely, comrades, you do not want Jones back. Once again, this argument was unanswerable. 
Certainly the animals did not want Jones back. If the holding of debates on Sunday mornings was liable to bring him back, then the debates must stop. Boxer, who had now time to think things over, voiced the general feeling by saying, If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. And from then on, he adopted the maxim, Napoleon is always right, in addition to his private motto of, I will work harder. By this time, the weather had broken and the spring plowing had begun. The shed where Snowball had drawn his plans of the windmill had been shut up, and it was assumed that the plans had been rubbed off the floor. Every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, the animals assembled in the big barn to receive their orders for the week. The skull of Old Major, now clean of flesh, had been disinterred from the orchard and set up on a stump at the foot of the flagstaff beside the gun. After the hoisting of the flag, the animals were required to file past the skull in a reverent manner before entering the barn. Nowadays, they did not sit all together, as they had done in the past. Napoleon, with Squealer and another pig named Minimus, who had a remarkable gift for composing songs and poems, sat on the front of the raised platform, with the nine young dogs forming a semicircle around them, and the other pigs sitting behind. <clears throat> the rest of the animals sat facing them in the main body of the barn. Napoleon read out the orders for the week in a gruff soldierly style, and after a single singing of Beasts of England, the animals dispersed. On the third Sunday after Snowball's expulsion, the animals were somewhat surprised to hear Napoleon announce that the windmill was to be built after all. He did not give any reason for having changed his mind, but merely warned that the, an uh, the animals that this extra task would mean very hard work, and might even be necessary to reduce their rations. The plans, however, had all been prepared down to the last detail. A special committee of pigs had, uh, had been at work upon them for the past three weeks. The building of the windmill, with various other improvements, was expected to take two years. That evening, Squealer explained privately to the other animals that Napoleon had never really been opposed to the windmill. On the contrary, it was he who had advocated it in the beginning, and the plan which Snowball had drawn on the floor of the incubator shed had actually been stolen from among Napoleon's papers. The windmill was, in fact, Napoleon's own creation. Why then, asked somebody, had he spoken so strongly against it? Here Squealer look, looked very sly. That, he said, was Comrade Napoleon's cunning. He had seemed to oppose the windmill, merely as a maneuver to get rid of Snowball, who was a dangerous character and a bad influence. Now that Snowball was out of the way, the plan could go forward without his interference. This, said Squealer, was something called tactics. He repeated a number of times, Tactics, comrades, tactics. Skipping around and whisking his tail with a merry laugh. The animals were not certain what the word meant, but Squealer spoke so persuasively, and the three dogs who happened to be with him growled so threateningly that they accepted his explanation without further questions. Chapter 6 All that year the animals worked like slaves, but they were happy in their work. They grudged no effort or sacrifice, well aware that everything that they did was for the benefit of themselves and those of their kind who would come after them, and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. Throughout the spring and the summer, they worked a 60-hour week, and in August, Napoleon announced that there would be work on Sunday afternoons as well. This work was strictly voluntary, but any animal who absented himself from it would have his rations reduced by half. Even so, it was found necessary to leave certain tasks undone. The harvest was a little less successful than in the previous year, and two fields which should have been sown with roots in the early summer were not sown because the plowing had not been completed early enough. It was possible to foresee that the coming winter would be a hard one. The windmill presented unexpected difficulties. There was a good quarry of limestone on the farm, and plenty of sand and cement could be found in one of the outhouses, so that all the materials for building were at hand. But the problem the animals could not first solve was how to break up the stone pieces of, into sorry the stone into pieces of suitable size. There seemed no way of doing this except with picks and crowbars, which no animal could use because no animal could stand on its hind legs. Only after weeks of vain effort did the right idea occur to somebody, namely to utilize the force of gravity. Huge boulders, far too big to be used as they were, were lying all over the bed of the quarry. The animals lashed ropes around these. And then altogether, cows, horses, sheep, any animals that could lay hold of a rope, even the pigs sometimes, joined in a, and at critical moments. They would drag them with desperate slowness up the slope to the top of the quarry, where they toppled over the edge to shatter to pieces below. 
Transporting the stone when it was once broken was comparatively simple. The horses carried it off in cartloads. The sheep dragged single blocks. Even Muriel and Benjamin yoked themselves into an old governess cart and did their share. By late summer, a sufficient store of stone had been accumulated, and then the building began, under the superintendence of the pigs. <clears throat> but it was a slow, laborious process. Frequently, it took the whole day of exhausting effort to drag a single boulder to the top of the quarry, and sometimes, when it was pushed over the edge, it failed to break. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer, whose strength seemed to equal that of the rest of the animals put together. When the boulder began to slip and the animals cried out in despair at finding themselves dragged down the hill, it was always Boxer who strained himself against the rope and brought the boulder to a stop. To see him toiling up the slope inch by inch, his breath coming fast, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground, and his great size matted with sweat, filled everyone with admiration. Clover warned him sometimes to be careful and not to overstrain himself, but Boxer would never listen to her. His two slogans, I will work harder, and Napoleon is always right, seemed to him a sufficient answer to all problems. He had made arrangements with the cockerel to call him three quarters of an hour earlier in the mornings instead of the half an hour. And in his spare moments, of which there were not many nowadays, he would go alone to the quarry, collect a load of broken stone, and drag it down to the site of the windmill unassisted. The animals were not badly off throughout that summer, in spite of the hardness of their work. If they had no more food than they had in Jones' day, at least they did not have less. The advantage of only having to feed themselves and not having to support five extravagant human beings as well was so great that it would have taken a lot of failures to outweigh it. And in many ways, the animal method of doing things was more efficient and saved labor. Such jobs as weeding, for instance, could be done with a thoroughness impossible to human beings. And since no animal now stole, it was unnecessary to fence off pasture from arable land, which saved a lot of labor on the upkeep of hedges and gates. Nevertheless, as summer wore on, the various unforeseen shortages began to make themselves felt. There was a need of paraffin oil, nails, string, dog biscuits, and iron for the horse's shoes, none of which could be produced on the farm. <clears throat> Later, there would also be need for seeds and artificial manures, besides various tools, and finally the machinery for the windmill. How these were to be procured, no one was able to imagine. On one Sunday morning, when the animals were assembled to receive their orders, Napoleon announced that he had decided on a new policy. From now onwards, Animal Farm would engage in trade with the neighboring farms. Not, of course, for any commercial purpose, but simply in order to obtain uh, certain materials which were urgently necessary. The needs of the windmill must override everything else, he said. He was therefore making arrangements to sell a stack of hay and part of the current year's wheat crop, and later on, if more money were needed, it would be made up by the sale of eggs, for which there was always a market in Willingdon. The hens, said Napoleon, should welcome this sacrifice as their own special contribution towards the building of the windmill. Once again, the animals were conscious of a vague uneasiness. Never to have dealings with human beings, never to engage in trade, never to make use of money, had these not been among the earliest resolutions passed at the first triumphant meeting after Jones was expelled? All the animals remembered passing such resolutions, or at least they thought they remembered it. The four young pigs who had protested when Napoleon abolished the meetings raised their voices timidly, but they were promptly silenced by a tremendous growling from the dogs. Then, as usual, the sheep broke into four legs good, two legs bad, and the momentary awkwardness was smoothed over. Finally, Napoleon raised his trotter and, uh, for silence and announced that he had already made all the arrangements. There would be no need for any animals to come into contact with human beings, which would clearly be most undesirable. He intended to take the whole burden upon his own shoulders. A Mr. Wimper, a, sol a solicitor living in Willingdon, had agreed to act as intermediary between Animal Farm and the outside world, and would visit the farm every Monday morning to receive his instructions. Napoleon ended the speech with his usual cry of, Long live Animal Farm! And after the singing of Beasts of England, the animals were dismissed. Afterwards, Squealer made a round of the farm and set the animals' minds at rest. He assured them that the resolution against engaging in trade and using money had never been passed or even suggested. It was pure imagination, probably traceable in the beginning to lies circulated by Snowball. A few animals felt faintly doubtful, but Squealer asked them shrewdly, are you certain that this is not something that you have dreamed, comrades? Have you any record of such a resolution? Is it written down anywhere? 
and since it is certainly true that nothing of this kind existed in writing, the animals were satisfied that they had been mistaken. <clears throat> Every Monday, Mr. Wimper visited the farm as had been arranged. He was a sly-looking little man with, a si with side whiskers, a solicitor in a very small way of business, but sharp enough to have realized earlier than anyone else that Animal Farm would need a broker and that the commissions would be worth having. The animals watched his coming and going with a kind of dread and avoided him as much as possible. Nevertheless, the sight of Napoleon on all fours delivering orders to Wimper, who stood on two legs, roused their pride and partly reconciled them to the new arrangement. Their relations with the human race were now not quite the same as they had been before. The human beings did not hate Animal Farm any less now that it was prospering. Indeed, they hated it more than ever. Every human being held it as an article of faith that the farm would go bankrupt sooner or later, and above all, that the windmill would be a failure. They would meet in the public houses to prove to one another by means of diagrams that the windmill was bound to fall down, or that if it did stand up, that it would never work. And yet against their will, they had developed a certain respect for the efficiency with which the animals were managing their own affairs. One symptom of this was that they had begun to call Animal Farm by its proper name, and had ceased to pretend that it was called Manor Farm. They had also dropped their championship of Jones, who had given up hope of getting his farm back and had gone to live in another part of the country. Except through Whimper, there was yet no contact between Animal Farm and the outside world, but there were con constant rumors that Napoleon was about to enter into a definite business arrangement, either with Mr. Pilkington of Foxwood or with, with Mr. Frederick of Pitchfield but never, it was noted, with both simultaneously. <clears throat> it was about this time that the pig suddenly moved into the farmhouse and took up residence there. Again, the animals seemed to remember that a resolution against this had been passed in the early days, and again Squealer was able to convince them that this was not the case. It was absolutely necessary, he said, that the pigs, who were the brains of the farm, could have a quiet place to work in. It was also more suited to the dignity of the leader, for of late he had been taken to speaking of Napoleon under the title of leader, to live in a house rather than a mere sty. Nevertheless, some of the animals were disturbed when they heard that the pigs not only took their meals in the kitchen and used the drawing room as a recreation room, but also slept in beds. Boxer passed it off with the usual, Napoleon is always right, but Clover, who thought that she remembered a definite ruling against beds, went to the end of the barn and tried to puzzle out the seven commandments which were inscribed there. Finding herself unable to read more than individual letters, she fetched Muriel. Muriel, she said, read me the fourth commandment. Does it not say something about never sleeping in a bed? With some difficulty, Muriel spelt it out. It says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets she announced finally. Curiously enough, Clover had not remembered that the fourth commandment mentioned sheets. But it was there on the wall, and so it must have been so. And Squealer, who happened to be passing by at the moment, attended by two or three dogs, was able to put the whole matter in proper perspective. You've heard then, comrades, he said, that we pigs now sleep in beds in the farmhouse? And why not? You did not suppose that there was ever a ruling against beds? A mere bed means a place to sleep in. A pile of straw in a stall is a bed properly regarded. The rule was against sheets, which are a human invention. We have removed the sheets from the farmhouse beds and sleep between blankets. And very comfortable beds they are too, but not more comfortable than we need, I can tell you, comrades, with all the brain work that we have to do nowadays. You would not rob us of our repose, would you, comrades? You would not have us too tired to carry out our duties. Surely none of you wishes to see Jones back. The animals reassured him on this point immediately, and no more was said about pigs sleeping in their farmhouse beds. And when, some days afterwards, it was announced that from now on pigs would get up an hour later in the mornings than the other animals, no complaint was made about that either. By the autumn, the animals were tired but happy. They had had a hard year, and after the sale of part of the hay and the corn from the stores of the food for win uh, sorry, they had had a hard year, and after the sale of part of the hay and corn, the stores of food for the winter were none too plentiful, but the windmill compensated for everything. It was almost half built now. After the harvest, there was a stretch of clear, dry weather, and the animals toiled harder than ever, thinking it well uh, with their while to plod to and fro all day with blocks of stone, if by <clears throat> doing so they could raise the walls another foot. Boxer would even come out at nights and work for an hour or two by his own... Uh, on his own by the light of the harvest moon. 
In their spare moments, the animals would walk round and round the half-finished mill, admiring the strength and per uh, sorry perpendicularity of its walls, and marveling that they should ever have been able to build anything so imposing. Only old Benjamin refused to grow enthusiastic about the windmill, though, as usual, he would utter nothing beyond the usual cryptic remark that donkeys live a long time. November came, with raging southwest winds. Building had to stop because it was now too wet to mix the cement. Finally, there came a night when the gale was so violent that the farm's buildings rocked on their foundations and several tiles were blown up, uh, sorry, blown off the roof of the barn. The hens woke up squawking with terror because they had all dreamed simultaneously of hearing a gun go off in the distance. In the morning, the animals came out of their stalls to find the flagstaff had been blown down and an elm tree at the foot of the orchard had been plucked up like a radish. They had just noticed this when a cry of despair broke from every animal's throat. A terrible sight had met their eyes. The windmill was in ruins. With one accord, they dashed down to the spot. Napoleon, who seldom moved out of a walk, raced ahead of all of them. Yes, there it lay, the fruit of all their struggles leveled to its foundations. The stones they had broken and carried so laboriously scattered all around. Unable at first to speak, they stood gazing mournfully at the litter of fallen stone. Napoleon paced to and fro in silence, occasionally snuffing the ground. His tail had grown rigid and twitched sharply from side to side. A sign in him of intense mental activity. Suddenly he halted as though his mind were made up. Comrades, he said quietly, do you know who is responsible for this? Do you know the enemy who came in the night to overthrow the windmill? Snowball! He suddenly roared in a voice of thunder. Snowball has done this thing, in sheer malignity, thinking to set back our plans and avenge himself of the ignominious expulsion. This traitor has crept here under the cover of night and destroyed our work of nearly a year. Comrades, here and now I pronounce a death sentence upon Snowball. Animal hero, second class, and a half bushel of apples to any animal who brings him to justice. A full bushel to anyone who captures him alive. The animals were shocked beyond measure to learn that even Snowball could be guilty of such an action. This, there was a cry of indignation, and everyone began thinking out of ways of catching Snowball if, they should ever, if he should ever come back. Almost immediately, the footprints of a pig were discovered in the grass at a little distance from the knoll. They could be traced back for a few yards, but apparently led to a hole in a hedge. Napoleon snuffed deeply at them and pronounced them to be Snowballs. He gave it as his opinion that Snowball had probably come from the direction of Foxwood Farm. No more delays, comrades, cried Napoleon when the footprints had been examined. There was work to be done. This very morning we begin rebuilding the windmill, and we will build it all through the winter, rain or shine. We will teach this miserable traitor that he cannot undo our work so easily. Remember, comrades, there must be no alteration in our plans. They shall be carried out to the long day. Forward, comrades. Long live the windmill. Long live Animal Farm. Chapter 7 It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow, and then by a hard frost which did not break until well into February. The animals carried on as best they could with the rebuilding of the windmill, well knowing that the outside world was watching them, and that the envious human beings would rejoice and triumph if the mill were not finished on time. Out of spite, the human beings pretended not to believe that it was Snowball who had destroyed the windmill. They said that it had fallen down because the walls were too thin. The animals knew that this was not the case. Still, it had been decided to build the walls three feet thick this time instead of 18 inches as before which meant collecting much larger quantities of stone. For a long time, the quarry was full of snowdrifts, and nothing could be done. Some progress was made in the dry, frosty weather that followed, but it was cruel work, and the animals could not feel so hopeful about it as they had before. They were always cold, and usually hungry as well. Only Boxer and Clover never lost heart. Squealer made excellent speeches on the joy of service and the dignity of labor, but the other animals found more inspiration in Boxer's strength and his never-failing cry of, I will work harder. In January, food fell short. The corn ration was drastically reduced, and it was announced that an extra potato ration would be issued to make up for it. Then it was discovered that the greater part of the potato crop had been frosted in the clamps, which had not been covered thickly enough. The potatoes had become soft and discolored, and only a few were edible. 
For days at a time, the animals had nothing to eat but chaff and mangles. Starvation seemed to stare them in the face. It was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. Emboldened by the collapse of the windmill, the human beings were inventing fresh lies about Animal Farm. Once again, it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine or disease, and that they were continually fighting amongst themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make use of Mr. Wimper to spread a contrary impression. Hitherto, the animals had little or no contact with Wimper on, a week, on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing that rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered almost, uh, the almost empty bins in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with sand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable pretext, Wimper was led through the store shed and allowed to catch a glimpse of the bins. He was deceived and continued to report to the outside world that there was no food shortage on Animal Farm. Nevertheless, towards the end of January, it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. In these days, Napoleon rarely appeared in public, but spent all of his time in the farmhouse, which was guarded at each door by fierce-looking dogs. When he did emerge, it was in a ceremonial matter, with an escort of six dogs who so closely surrounded him and growled if anyone came too near. Frequently, he did not even appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually Squealer. One Sunday morning, Squealer announced that, he, that the hens, who had just come to, in to lay again, must surrender their eggs. Napoleon had accepted through, winter, a, a, sorry, through Whimper a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of these would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going until summer uh, came on and conditions were easier. When the hens heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but they had not believed that it would actually happen. They were just getting their clutches ready for the spring sitting, and they protested that to take the eggs away now was murder. For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. Led by three young black Menorca pullets, the hens made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the rafters, and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hens' rations to be stopped and decreed that any animal giving them as much a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dogs saw to it that these orders were carried out. For five days, the hens held out, and then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens had died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard, and it was given out that they had died of cockadosis. Wimper had heard nothing of this affair, and the eggs were duly delivered a grocer's van give, driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. All the while, no more had been seen of Snowball. He was rumored to be hiding on one of the neighboring farms, either Foxwood or Pitchfield. Uh, Napoleon was by this time on slightly better terms with the other farmers than before. It happened that there was in the yard a pile of timber which had been stacked there ten years earlier when a beech spinnery was cleared. Sorry, when a beech spinney was cleared. It was well-seasoned, and Wimper had advised Napoleon to sell it. Both Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick were anxious to buy it. Napoleon was hesitating between the two, unable to make up his mind. It was noticed that whenever he seemed on the point of coming to an agreement with Frederick, Snowball was declared to be hiding in Foxwood, while when he was inclined towards Pilkington, Snowball, said that it was, uh, Snowball was said to be in Pinchfield. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered— Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm by night. The animals were so disturbed that they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night it was said that he came creeping under the cover of darkness and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn, he upset the milk pails, he broke the eggs, he trampled the seed beds, he gnawed the bark off the fruit trees. Whatever anything went wrong, it became usual to attribute it to Snowball. If a window was broken or a drain was blocked up, someone was certain to say that Snowball had come in the night and done it. And when the key to the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that Snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this, even after the mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The cows declared unanimously that Snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with Snowball. Napoleon decreed that... Uh, <clears throat> 
Napoleon decreed that there should be a full investigation into Snowball's activities. With his dog and at dogs in attendance, he set out and made a careful tour of inspection of the farm buildings, the other animals following at a respectful distance. At every few steps, Napoleon stopped and snuffed the ground for traces of Snowball's footsteps, which, he said, he could detect by the smell. He snuffed in every corner in the barn, in the cowshed, in the hen houses, in the vegetable garden, and found traces of Snowball almost everywhere. He put his snout into the ground, give several deep sniffs and exclaim in a terrible voice, Snowball! He has been here. I can smell him distinctly. And at the word Snowball, the dogs let out a blood-curdling curdling growl and showed their side teeth. The animals were thoroughly frightened. It seemed to them that Snowball were some kind of invisible influence, pervading the air about them and menacing them with all kinds of dangers. In the evening, Squealer called them together, and with an alarmed expression on his face, he told them that there was some serious news to reports. Comrades, cried Squealer, making little nervous skips. A most terrible thing has been discovered. Snowball has sold himself to Frederick of Pitchfield Farm, who is even now plotting to attack us to take our farm away from us. Snowball is to act as his guide when the attack begins, but there is worse than that. We had thought that Snowball's rebellion was caused simply by his vanity and his ambition, but we were wrong, comrades. Do you know what the real reason was? Snowball was in league with Jones at the very start. He was Jones's secret agent all this time. It has been proved by documents which were left behind uh, and which we've only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Did we not see for ourselves how he attempted, fortunately without success, to get us defeated and destroyed at the Battle of the Cowshed? The animals were stupefied. This was a wickedness far outdoing Snowball's destruction of the windmill, but it was some minutes before they could fully take it in. They all remembered, or thought they remembered, how they had seen Snowball charging ahead of them at the Battle of the Cowshed, how he had rallied and encouraged them at every turn, and how he had not paused for an instant, even when the pellets from Jones's gun had wounded his back. At first, it was a little difficult to see how this fitted in with the, his being on Jones's side. Even Boxer, who seldom asked questions, was puzzled. He laid down, tuck his, tucked his four hooves beneath him, shut his eyes, and with a hard effort managed to formulate his thoughts. I do not believe that, he said. Snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. I saw him myself. Did we not give him Animal Hero first class immediately afterwards? That was our mistake, comrade. For we know now it is all written down in the secret documents that we have found, that in reality he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded, said Broxer. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement, cried Squealer. Jones's shot only grazed him. I could show you this in his own writing if you were able to read it. The plot was for Snowball at the critical moment to give the signal for flight and to leave the field to the enemy. And he verily nearly succeeded, I would say, comrades. He would have succeeded had it not been for our heroic leader, Comrade Napoleon. Do you not remember how, just at the moment when Jones and his men had gotten inside the yard, Snowball suddenly turned and fled, and many animals followed him? And do you not remember, too, that this was just at that moment when panic was spreading and all seemed lost, that Comrade Napoleon sprang forward with a cry of, Death to humanity! and sank his teeth into Jones's leg. Surely you remember that, comrades! exclaimed Squealer, frisking from side to side. Now, when Squealer described the scene so graphically, it seemed to the animals that they did remember it. At any rate, they remembered that at the critical moment of the battle, Snowball had turned to flee, but Boxer was still a little e uneasy. I do not believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning, he said finally. What he has done since is different, but I believe that at the Battle of the Cowshed, he was a good comrade. Our dear leader, Comrade Napoleon, announced Squealer, speaking very slowly and firmly, has stated categorically, categorically, comrade, that Snowball was Jones's agent from the very beginning. Yes, and from long before the rebellion was ever thought of. Ah, that is different, said Boxer. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. That's the true spirit, comrade, cried Squealer. It was noticed that he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkling eyes. He turned to go and then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open, for we have reason to think that some of Snowball's secret agents are lurking among us at this moment. Four days later, in the late afternoon, Napoleon ordered all the animals to assemble in the yard. 
When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse, wearing both his medals, for he'd recently awarded himself Animal Hero First Class and Animal Hero Second Class, with his huge nine dogs frisking around him and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animals' spines. They all cowered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible thing was about to happen. Napoleon stood sternly surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear, and dragged them squealing with pain and terror to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding, the dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them coming and put out his great hoof, caught a dog mid-air, and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy, and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether or not he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance, and then sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go, whereat Boxer lifted his hoof, and the dog slunk away, bruised and howling. Presently the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling, with guilt written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs who had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball since his very expulsion, and that they had collaborated him, with him in destroying the windmill, and that they had entered into an agreement with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They had added that Snowball had privately admitted to them when he had been Jones's secret agent for years past. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out, and in a terrible voice Napoleon demanded whether any other animal had anything else to confess. The three hens who had been the ringleaders in the attempted rebellion over the eggs now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during last year's harvest and to have eaten them in a night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this, she said, by Snowball, and two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram, an especially devoted follower of Napoleon, by chasing him around and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot, and so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown since the expulsion of Jones. When it was all over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and the dogs, crept away in a body. They were shaken and miserable. They did not know which was more shocking, the treachery of the animals who had leagued themselves with Snowball or the cruel retribution that they had just witnessed. In the old days, there had been scenes of bloodshed equally terrible, but it seemed to all of them that it was far worse now that it was happening among themselves. Since Jones had left the farm, until today no animal had killed another animal. Not even a rat had been killed. They had made their way onto the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, and with one accord they all lay down, as though huddling together for warmth. Clover, Muriel, Benjamin, the cows, the sheep, and the whole flock of geese and hens, everyone indeed except the cat, who had suddenly disappeared just before Napoleon ordered the animals to assemble. For some time nobody spoke. Only Boxer remained on his feet. He fidgeted to and fro, swishing his long black tail against the sides and occasionally uttering a little whinny of surprise. Finally, he said, I do not understand it. I would not have believed that such things could happen on our farm. It must be due to some fault in ourselves. The solution, as I see it, is to work harder. From now onwards, I shall get up a full hour earlier in the mornings. And as he moved off, his lumbering trot, he, uh, sorry, and he moved off at his lumbering trot and made for the quarry. Having got there, he collected two successive loads of stone and dragged them down to the windmill before retiring for the night. The animals huddled about Clover, not speaking. The knoll where they were laying gave them a wide prospect across the countryside. Most of Animal Farm was within their view, the long pastures stretching down the main road, the hayfield, the spinney, the drinking pool, the plowed fields where the young wheat was thick and green, and the red roofs of the farm buildings, and the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were uh, gilded by the level rays of the sun. Never had the farm, with a kind of surprise they remembered that was their own farm, every inch of it their own property, 
appeared to the animals so desirable a place. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she could have spoken her thoughts, it would have been to say that this was not what they had aimed at when they had set themselves years ago to work to overthrow the human race. These scenes of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on the night when Old Major first stirred them to rebellion. If she herself had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the whip, all equal, each working according to his capacity, the strong protecting the weak, as she had protected the lost brood of ducklings with her foreleg on the night of the major's speech. Instead, she did not know why uh, they had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. There was no thought of rebellion or disobedience in her mind. She knew that even as things were, uh, were, they were far better when they had been in the days of Jones, but that before else it was needful to prevent the return of human beings. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that were given to her, and accept the leadership of Napoleon. But still, it was not for this that she and the other animals had hoped and toiled, it was not for this that they had built the windmill and faced the pallets of Jones's gun. Such were her thoughts, though she lacked the words to express them. At last, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for the words that she was unable to find, she began to sing Beasts of England. The other animals sitting around her took it up, and they sang it three times over, very tunefully, but slowly and mournfully, in a way that they had never sung it before. They had just finished singing it for the third time when Squealer, attended by two dogs, approached them with the air of having something important to say. He announced that, by a special decree of Comrade Napoleon, Beasts of England had been abolished. From now onwards, it was forbidden to sing it. The animals were taken aback. Why? cried Muriel. It is no longer needed, Comrade, said Squealer stiffly. Beasts of England was the song of the rebellion, but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The enemy of uh, both external and internal has been defeated. In Beasts of England, we expressed our longing for a better society in the days to come. But that society has now been established. Clearly, this song no longer has any purpose. Frightened though they were, some of the animals might possibly have protested. But at this moment, the sheep set to their usual bleeding of, Four legs good, two legs bad which went on for several minutes and put an end to the discussion. So Beasts of England was heard no more. In its place, Minimus, the poet, had composed another song, which began, Animal farm, animal farm, never through me thou come to har- shalt thou come to harm. And this was sung every Sunday morning after the hoisting of the flag. But somehow, neither the words nor the tune ever seemed to the animals to come up to Beasts of England. I just need a quick pause for some water. <clears throat> Chapter 8 a few days later, when the terror caused by the executions had died down, some of the animals remembered, or thought they remembered, that the Sixth Commandment decreed no animal shall kill any other animal. And though no one cared to mention it in the hearings of the pig... <clears throat> Sorry, let me try that again. Chapter 8. A few days later, when the terror caused by the executions had died down, some of the animals remembered, or thought that they remembered, that the Sixth Commandment decreed no animal shall kill any other animal and then no one cared to mention it in the hearing of the pigs or the dogs, it was felt that the killings which had taken place did not square with this. Clover asked Benjamin to read her the Sixth Commandment, and when Benjamin, as usual, said that he refused to meddle in such matters, she fetched Muriel. Muriel read the commandment for her. It ran, No animal shall kill any other animal without cause. Somehow or other, the last two words had slipped out of the animal's memory. But they saw now that the commandment had not been violated, for clearly there was good reason for killing the traitors who had leagued themselves with Snowball. Throughout that year, the animals worked even harder and they had worked in the, uh, than they had worked in the previous year. 
to rebuild the windmill with walls twice as thick before, and to finish it by the appointed date together with the regular work on the farm was a tremendous labor. There were times when it seemed to the animals that they worked longer hours and fed no better than they had done in the uh, Jones's day. On Sunday morning, Squealer, holding down a long strip of paper with his trotter, would read out to them lists of figures proving that production of every class of foodstuff had increased by 200%, 300%, or 500%, as the case may be. The animals saw no reason to disbelieve him, especially as they could no longer remember very clearly what conditions had been like before the rebellion. All the same, there were days when they felt that they would have sooner have had less figures and more food. All orders were now issued through Squealer or one of the other pigs. Napoleon himself was not seen in public as often as once in a fortnight. When he did appear, he was attended not only by his retinue of dogs, but by a black cockerel who marched in front of him and acted as a kind of trumpeter, letting out a log, cock a doodle doo before Napoleon spoke. Even in the farmhouse, it was said, Napoleon inhabited separate apartments from the others. He took his meals alone, with two dogs to wait upon him, and always ate from the Crown Derby dinner service, which had been in the glass cupboard in the drawing room. It was also announced that the gun would be fired every year on Napoleon's birthday, as well as on the other two anniversaries. Napoleon was now never spoken of simply as Napoleon. He was always referred to in the former style as our leader, Comrade Napoleon, and the pigs liked to invent for him titles such as Father of All Animals, Terror of Mankind, Protector of the Sheepfold, Duckling's Friend, and the like. In his speeches, Squealer would uh, talk with tears rolling down his cheeks of Napoleon's wisdom, the goodness of his heart, and the deep love he bore to all animals everywhere, even and especially the unhappy level animals who still lived in ignorance and slavery on other farms. It had become usual to give Napoleon credit for every successful achievement and every stroke of good fortune. He would often hear one hen remark to another, Under the guidance of our leader, Comrade Napoleon, I have laid five eggs in six days. Or two cows enjoying a drink at the pool would exclaim, Thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, how excellent this water tastes. The general feeling on the farm was expressed in a poem entitled Comrade Napoleon, which was composed by Minimus, and which ran as follows. Friend of the featherless, fountain of happiness, lord of the swill bucket, oh how my soul is on fire when I gaze at thy calm and commanding eye, like the sun in the sky, comrade Napoleon. Thou art the giver of all thy creatures love, full belly twice a day, clean straw to roll upon, every beast great or small, sleeps at peace in his stall, thou watchest over all, comrade Napoleon. Had I a suckling pig, ere he had grown as big, even as a pint bottle or as a rolling pin, he should have learned to be faithful and true to thee. Yes, his first queek should be Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon approved of this poem and caused it to be inscribed on the wall of the big barn at the opposite end from the Seven Commandments. It was surmounted by a portrait of Napoleon in profile, executed by a squealer in white paint. Meanwhile, uh, through the agency of Wimper, Napoleon was engaged in complicated negotiations with, Fr with Frederick and Pilkington. The pile of timber was still unsold. Of the two, Frederick was more anxious to get a, hand a hold of it, but he would not offer a reasonable price. At the same time, there were renewed rumors that Frederick and his men were plotting to attack Animal Farm and to destroy the windmill, the building which had aroused such furious jealousy in him. Snowball was known to be still suck, uh, skulking on Pitchfield Farm. In the middle of the summer, the animals were alarmed to hear that three hens had come forward and confessed that, inspired by Snowball, they had entered into a plot to murder Napoleon. They were executed immediately, and fresh precautions for Napoleon's safety were taken. Four dogs guarded his bed at night, one at each corner, and a young pig named Pink Eye was given the task of tasting all of his food before he ate it, lest it should be poisoned. At about the same time, it was given out that Napoleon had arranged to sell the pile of timber to Mr. Pilkington. Uh, he was also going, to en also going to enter into a regular agreement for the exchange of certain products between Animal Farm and Foxwood. The relations between Napoleon and Pilkington, though they were now uh, only conducted through Whimper, were now almost friendly. The animals distrusted Pilkington as a human being, but greatly preferred him to Frederick, whom they both feared and hated. <clears throat> As the summer wore on, the windmill neared completion. The rumors of an impending uh, treacherous attack grew stronger and stronger. 
Frederick, it was said, intended to bring against them twenty men all armed with guns, and he had already bribed the magistrates and police so that if he could get hold of, uh, if he could once get hold of the title deeds of Animal Farm, they would ask no questions. Moreover, terrible stories were leaking out from Pitchfield about the cruelties that Frederick practiced upon his animals. He had flogged an old horse to death. He had starved his cows. He had killed a dog by throwing it into a furnace. He amused himself in the evenings by making cocks fight with splinters of razor blade tied to their spurs. The animals' blood boiled with rage when they heard of the things being done to their comrades, and sometimes they clamored to be allowed to go out in a body and attack Pitchfield Farm, drive out the humans and set the animals free. But Squealer counseled them to avoid rash decisions and to trust in Comrade Napoleon's strategy. Nevertheless, feeling against Frederick continued to run high. One Sunday morning, Napoleon appeared in the barn and explained that he had never had any, sorry, he never at any time contemplated selling the pile of timber to Frederick. He considered it beneath his dignity, he said, to have dealings with scoundrels of that description. The pigeons, who were still sent out to spread tidings of the rebellion, were forbidden to set foot anywhere on Foxwood. They were also ordered to drop their former slogan of death to humanity in favor of death to Frederick. In the late summer, yet another of Snowball's machinations was laid bare. The wheat crop was full of weeds, and it was discovered that one of his nocturnal visit, in one of his nocturnal visits, Snowball had mixed weed seeds with seed corn. A gander, who had been privy to the plot, confessed his guilt uh, to Squealer and immediately committed suicide by swallowing deadly nightshade berries. The animals also learned that Snowball had never, as many of them had, been believed, uh, had believed hitherto, received the order of animal hero first class, this was merely a legend which had been spread some time after the Battle of the Cowshed by Snowball himself. So far from being decorated, he had been censured for showing cowardice in the battle. Once again, some of the animals heard this with a certain bewilderment, but Squealer was soon able to convince them that their memories had been at fault. In the autumn, by a tremendous, exhausting effort, for the harvest had to be gathered at almost the same time, the windmill was finished. The machinery still had to be installed, and Wimper was negotiating the purchase of it, but the structure was completed and the teeth, uh, in the teeth of every difficulty. In spite of inexperience, of primitive implements, of bad luck, and of Snowball's treachery, the work had been finished punctually to the very day. Tired out but proud, the animals walked round and round their masterpiece, which appeared even more beautiful in their eyes than when it had been built the first time. Moreover, the walls were twice as thick as before. Nothing short of explosives would lay them low this time. And when they thought about how they had labored, what discouragements they had overcome, and the enormous difference that would be made in their lives when the sails were turning and the dynamos running, when they thought of all this, their tiredness forsook them, and they gambled round and round the windmill, uttering cries of triumph. Napoleon himself, attended by his dogs and his cockerel, came down to inspect the completed work. He personally congratulated the animals on their achievements, and announced that the mill would be named Napoleon Mill. Two days later, the animals were called together for a special meeting in the barn. They were struck dumb with surprise when Napoleon announced that he had sold the pile of timber to Frederick. Tomorrow, Frederick's wagons would arrive to begin carrying it away. Throughout the whole period of his seeming friendship with Pilkington, Napoleon had really been in secret agreement with Frederick. All relations with Foxwood had been broken off. Insulting messages had been sent to Pilkington. The pigeons had been told to avoid Pitchfield Farm and to alter their slogan from Death to Frederick to Death to Pilkington. At the same time, Napoleon assured the animals that the stories of the impending attack on Animal Farm were completely untrue, and that the tales about Frederick's cruelty to his own animals had been greatly exaggerated. All these rumors had probably originated with Snowball and his agents. It now appeared that Snowball was not, after all, hiding on Pinchfield Farm, and in fact had never been there in his life. He was living in considerable luxury, so it was said, at Foxwood, and had in reality been a pensioner of Pilkington for years past. The pigs were in ecstasies over Napoleon's cunning. Sorry, Napoleon's cunning. By seeming to be friendly with Pilkington, he had forced Frederick to raise his price by twelve pounds. But the superior quality of Napoleon's mind, said Squealer, was shown in the fact that he trusted nobody, not even Frederick. Frederick had wanted to pay for timber with something called a check which was, uh, seemed to be a piece of paper with a promise to pay written upon it. But Napoleon was too clever for him. He demanded payment in real five-pound notes, which were to be handed over before the timber was removed. Already Frederick had paid up, 
and the sum was paid just uh, the sum he paid was just enough to buy the machinery for the windmill. Meanwhile, the timber was being carted away at high speed. When it was all gone, another special meeting was held in the barn for the animals to inspect Frederick's excuse me banknotes. Sorry. Smiling beatifically and wearing both his decorations, Napoleon reposed on a bed of straw on the platform with the money at his side neatly piled on a china dish from the farmhouse kitchen. The animals filed slowly past and each gazed his fill. As Boxer put out his nose to sniff the banknotes and the flimsy white things stirred and rustled in his breath. Three days later, there was a terrible hullabaloo Wimper, his face deadly pale, came racing up the path on his bicycle, flung it down in the yard, and rushed straight into the farmhouse. The next moment, a choking roar of rage sounded from Napoleon's apartments. The news of what happened sped around the farm like wildfire. The banknotes were forgeries. Frederick had gotten the timber for nothing. Napoleon called the animals together immediately, and in a terrible voice pronounced a death sentence upon Frederick. When captured, he said Frederick should be boiled alive. At the same time, he warned that after this treacherous deed, the worst was to be expected. Frederick and his men might make their long-expected attack at any moment. Sentinels were placed at all approaches to the farm. In addition, four pigeons were sent to Foxwood uh, with a conciliatory message, which was hoped might reestablish good relations with Pilkington. The very next morning, the attack came. The animals were at breakfast when the lookouts came racing in with the news that Frederick and his followers had already come through the five-barred gate. Boldly enough, the animals sallied forth to meet them, but this time they did not have the easy victory that they had had in the Battle of the Cowshed. There were fifteen men with a half dozen guns between them, and they opened fire as soon as they got within fifty yards. The animals could not face the terrible explosions of the stinging and the stinging pellets, and in spite of the efforts of Napoleon and Boxer to rally them, they were soon driven back. A number of them were already wounded. They took refuge in the farm buildings and peeped cautiously out from the chinks and knot holes. The whole of the big pasture, including the windmill, was in the hands of the enemy. For the moment, even uh, even Napoleon seemed at a loss. He paced up and down without a word, his tail rigid and twitching. Wistful glances were sent in the direction of Foxwood. If Pilkington and his men would help them, the day may yet be won. But at this moment, the four pigeons who had been sent out on the day before returned, one of them bearing a scrap of paper from Pilkington. On it was penciled the words, Serves you right. Meanwhile, Frederick and his men had halted about the windmill. The animals watched them, and a murmur of dismay went around. Two of the men had produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock the windmill down. Impossible, cried Napoleon. We built the walls far too thick for that. We could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades. But Benjamin was watching the movements of the men intently. The two with the hammer and the crowbar were drilling a hole near the base of the windmill. Slowly, with an air of almost amusement... Benjamin nodded his long muzzle. I thought so, he said. Do you not see what they're doing? In another moment, they are going to pack blasting powder into that hole. Terrified, the animals waited. It was impossible now to venture out of the shelter of the buildings. After a few minutes, the men were seen to be running in all directions, and then there was a deafening roar. The pigeons swirled into the air, and all the animals except Napoleon flung themselves flat on their bellies and hid their faces. When they got up again, a huge cloud of black smoke was hanging where the windmill had been. Slowly the breeze drifted it away. The windmill had ceased to exist. At this sight, the animals' courage returned to them. The fear and despair that they had felt a moment earlier were drowned in their rage against this vile, contemptible act. A mighty cry for vengeance went out without warning. For further orders, they charged forth in a body and made straight for the enemy. This time they did not heed the cruel pellets that swept over them like hail. It was a savage, bitter battle. The men fired again and again, and when the animals got to close quarters, lashed out with their sticks and with their heavy boots. A cow, three sheep, and two geese were killed, and nearly everyone was wounded. Even Napoleon, who was directing operations from the rear, rear, had the tip of his tail chipped by a pellet. But the men did not go unscathed either. Three of them had their heads broken by blows from boxers' hooves, and another was gored in the belly by a cow's horn. Another had his trousers nearly torn off by Jesse and Bluebell. And when the nine dogs of Napoleon's own bodyguard, whom he had instructed to make a detour under the cover of the hedge, suddenly appeared on the men's flank, baying ferociously, panic overtook them. 
They saw that they were in danger of being surrounded. Frederick shouted to his men to get out while the going was good, and the next moment the cowardly enemy was running for dear life. The animals chased them right down to the bottom of the field and got in some last kicks as they were forced their way through the thorn, head, the thorn hedge. So they had won, but they were weary and they were bleeding. Slowly they began to limp back towards the farm. The sight of their dead comrades stretched upon the grass moved some of them to tears, and for a little while they halted in sorrowful silence at the place where the windmill had once stood. Yes, it was gone. Almost the last trace of their labor was gone. Even the foundations were partially destroyed, and in rebuilding it they could not... Uh, and in rebuilding, uh, rebuilding it, they could not this time, as before, make use of the fallen stones. This time, the stones had vanished too. The force of the explosion had flung them to distances of hundreds of yards. It was as though the windmill had never been. As they approached the farm, Squealer, who had unaccountably been absent during the fighting, came skipping towards them, whisking his tail and beaming with satisfaction. And the animals heard from the direction of the farm buildings the solemn booming of a gun. What is the gun firing for, said Boxer. To celebrate our victory, cried Squealer. What victory, said Boxer. His knees were bleeding. He had lost a shoe and split his hoof, and a dozen pellets had lodged themselves in his hind leg. What victory, comrade? Have we not driven an enemy off our soil, the sacred soil of Animal Farm? But they have destroyed the windmill, and we had worked on it for two years. What matter? We will build another windmill. We will build six windmills if we feel like it. You do not appreciate, comrade, the mighty thing that we have done. The enemy was in occupation of this very ground that we stand upon. And now, thanks to the leadership of comrade Napoleon, we have won every inch back of it back again. Sorry, every inch of it back again. Then we have won back what we had before, said Boxer. That is our victory, said Squealer. They limped into the yard. The pellets under the skin of Boxer's legs smarted painfully. He saw ahead of him the heavy labor of rebuilding the windmill from the foundations, and already in imagination he braced himself for the task. But for the first time it occurred to him that he was eleven years old, and perhaps his great muscles were not quite what they had once been. But when the animals saw the green flag flying, they heard the gun firing again, seven times it was fired in all, and heard the speech that Napoleon made, congratulating them on their conduct, it did seem to them, after all, that they had won a great victory. The animals slain in the battle were given a solemn funeral. Boxer and Clover pulled the wagon, which served as a hearse, and Napoleon himself walked at the head of the procession. Two whole days were given to celebrations. There were songs, speeches, and more firing of the gun, and a special gift of an apple was bestowed on every animal, with two ounces of corn for each bird and three biscuits for each dog. It was announced that the battle would be called the Battle of the Windmill, and that Napoleon had created a new decoration, the Order of the Green Banner, which he conferred upon himself. And the general rejoicings of the unfortunate affair of the bank, uh, sorry, in the general rejoicings, the unfortunate affair of the banknotes was forgotten. It was a few days later uh, than this that the pigs came upon a case of whiskey in the cellars of the farmhouse. The sound of loud singing, in which, to everyone's surprise, the strains of beasts of England were mixed up. Sorry, I'm going to try that again. It was a few days later uh, than this uh, that the pigs came upon a case of whiskey in the cellars of the farmhouse. It had been overlooked at the time when the house was first occupied. That night there came from the farmhouse the sound of loud singing, in which, to everyone's surprise, the strains of beasts of England were mixed up. At about half past nine, Napoleon, wearing an old bowler hat of Mr. Jones's, was distinctly seen to emerge from the back door, gallop rapidly around the yard, and disappear indoors again but in the morning a deep silence hung over the farmhouse. Not a pig appeared to be stirring. It was nearly nine o'clock when Squealer made his appearance, walking slowly and dejectedly, his eyes dull, his tail hanging limply behind him, and with every appearance of being seriously ill. He called the animals together and told them that he had a terrible piece of news to impart. Comrade Napoleon was dying. A cry of lamentation went up. Straw was laid down outside the doors of the farmhouse, and the animals walked on tiptoe. With tears in their eyes, they asked one another what they should do if their leader was taken away from them. A rumor went around that Snowball had, after all, contrived to introduce poison into Napoleon's food. At eleven o'clock, Squealer came out to make another announcement. As his last act upon earth, Comrade Napoleon had pronounced a solemn decree 
The drinking of alcohol was punishable by death. By the evening, however, Napoleon appeared to be somewhat better, and the following morning Squealer was able to tell them that he was well on the way to recovery. By the evening of the day, uh, sorry, <clears throat> by the evening of that day, Napoleon was back to work, and on the next day it was learned that he had instructed Wimper to purchase in Willingdon some booklets on brewing and distilling. A week later, Napoleon gave orders that a small paddock beyond the orchard, which had previously been intended to set aside as a grazing ground for animals who were past work, was to be plowed up. It was given uh, out that the pasture was exhausted and needed reseeding, but it soon became known that Napoleon intended to sow it with barley. About this time, there occurred a strange incident which hardly anyone was able to understand. One night, at about twelve o'clock, there was a loud crash in the yard, and the animals rushed out of their stalls. It was a moonlit night, and at the foot, uh, sorry, at the foot end of the wall of the big barn where the seven commandments were written, there lay a ladder broken in two pieces. Squealer, temporarily stunned, was sprawling beside it, and near at hand there lay a lantern, a paintbrush, and an overturned pot of white paint. The dogs immediately made a ring around Squealer and escorted him back to the farmhouse as soon as he was able to walk. None of the animals could form any idea as to what this meant, except old Benjamin, who nodded his muzzle with a knowing air and seemed to understand but would say nothing. But a few days later, Muriel, reading over the Seven Commandments to herself, noticed that there was yet another one of them which the animals had remembered wrong. They had thought that the fifth commandment was, No animal shall drink alcohol. But there were two words that they had forgotten. Actually, the commandment read, No animal shall drink alcohol to excess. Chapter 9 Boxer's split hoof was a long time in healing. They had started the rebuilding of the windmill the day after the victory celebrations were ended. Boxer refused to take even a day off work, and made it a point of honor not to let it be seen that he was in pain. In the evenings, he would admit privately to Clover that the hoof troubled him a great deal. Clover treated the hoof with poultices of herbs which she prepared by chewing them, and both she and Benjamin urged Boxer to work less hard. A horse's lungs do not last forever, she said to him, but Boxer would not listen. He had, he said, only one real ambition left, to see the windmill well under way before he reached the age of retirement. At the beginning, when the laws of Animal Farm were first formulated, the retiring age had been fixed for horses and pigs at twelve, for cows at fourteen, for dogs at nine, for sheep at seven, and for hens and geese at five. Liberal old age pensions had been agreed upon, and as yet no animal had actually retired on pension, but of late the subject had been discussed more and more. Now that the small field beyond the orchard had been set aside for barley, it was rumored that a corner of the large pasture was to be fenced off and turned into grazing ground for superannuated animals. For a horse, it was said, the pension would be five pounds of corn a day, and in winter fifteen pounds of hay with a carrot or possibly an apple on public holidays. Boxer's twelfth birthday was due in the late summer of the following year. Meanwhile, life was hard. The winter was as cold as the last one had been, and the food was even shorter. Once again, rations were reduced except for those of the pigs and the dogs. A too rigid equality in rations, uh, Squealer explained, would have been contrary to the principles of animalism. In any case, he had no difficulty in proving that the other, to the other animals they were really, they were, that they were not in reality short of food, whatever the appearances might be. For the time being, certainly, it had been found necessary to make a readjustment of rations, Squealer always spoke of readjustment, never a reduction. But in comparison with the days of Jones, the improvement was enormous. Reading out the figures in a shrill, rapid voice, he proved to them in every detail that they had more oats, more hay, more turnips than they had had in Jones's day. And they worked shorter hours, and their drinking water was of a lot better quality. That they lived longer, that a larger proportion of their young ones survived infancy, and that they had more straw in their stalls and suffered less from fleas. The animals believed every word of it. Truth to tell, Jones and all that he had stood for had almost faded out of their memories. They knew that life nowadays was harsh and bare, and that they were often hungry and often cold, but they were, uh, and that they were usually working when they were not asleep. <clears throat> but doubtless it had been worse in the old days. They were glad to believe so. Besides, in those days they had been slaves, and now they were free, and that made all the difference, as Squaler did not fail to point out. There are many more mouths to feed now, 
In the autumn, the four sows had littered almost simultaneously, producing 31 young pigs between them. The young pigs were piebald, and as Napoleon was the only boar on the farm, it was possible to guess at their parentage. It was announced that later, when bricks and timber had been purchased, a schoolroom would be built in the farmhouse garden. For the time being, the young pigs were given their instruction by Napoleon himself in the farmhouse gar uh, kitchen. They took their exercise in the garden and were discouraged from playing with the other young animals. About this time, too, it was laid down as a rule that when a pig and another ma animal met on the path, the other animal must stand aside, and also that all pigs, whatever degree, were to have the privilege of wearing green ribbons on their tails on Sundays. The farm had, been a fairly, had had a fairly successful year, but was still short of money. There were the bricks and the sand and the lime for the schoolroom to be purchased, and it would also be necessary to begin saving up again for the machinery of the windmill. Then there was the lamp oil and candles for the house, sugar for Napoleon's own table. He forbade this to the other pigs on the ground that it, grounds that it made them fat. And all the usual replacements, such as tools, nails, string, coal, wire, scrap iron, and dog biscuits. A stump of hay and a part of the potato crop were sold off, and the contract for eggs was increased to 600 a week, so that the year the hens barely hatched enough chicks to keep their numbers at the same level. Rations reduced in December were reduced again in February, and lanterns in the stalls were forbidden to save oil. But the pigs seemed comfortable enough, and in fact they were putting on weight, if anything. One afternoon in late February, a warm, rich, appetizing scent, such as the animals had never smelt before, wafted itself across the yard from the little brew house, which had, just been, uh, which had been disused in Jones's time, and which stood beyond the kitchen. Someone said it was the smell of cooking barley. The animals sniffed the air hungrily and wondered whether a warm mash was being prepared for their supper. But no warm mash appeared and on the following sun, uh, Sunday it was announced from now on uh, onwards that all barley would be reserved for the pigs. The field beyond the orchard had already been sown with barley, and the news soon leaked out that every pig was now receiving a ration of a pint of beer daily, with a half gallon for Napoleon himself, which was always served to him in the Crown Derby soup, uh, soup tureen. But if there were hardships to be borne, they were partly offset by the fact that life nowadays had a greater dignity than it had before. There were more songs, more speeches, more processions. Napoleon had commanded that once a week there should be held something called a spontaneous demonstration, the object of which was to celebrate the struggles and triumphs of Animal Farm. At the appointed time, the animals would leave their work and march round the precincts of the farm in military formation, with the pigs leading, then the horses, then the cows, then the sheep, and then the poultry. The dogs flanked the procession, and at the head of all marched Napoleon's black cockerel. Boxer and Clover always carried between them a green banner marked with the hoof and horn of the cap and the caption, Long Live Comrade Napoleon. Afterwards, there were recitations of poems composed in Napoleon's honor, and a speech by Squealer giving the particulars of the latest increases in the production of foodstuffs, and on occasion a shot was fired from the gun. The sheep were the greatest devotees of the spontaneous demonstrations, and if anyone complained, as a few animals sometimes did when no pigs or dogs were near, that they wasted time and meant a lot of standing about in the cold, the sheep were sure to silence them with a tremendous bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad. But by and large, the animals enjoyed these celebrations. They found it comforting to be reminded that, after all, they were truly their own masters, and that the work that they did was for their own benefit. So that with... So, <clears throat> so that what the, with the songs, the processions, squealers' lists of figures, and the thunder of the gun, the crowing of the cockerel, and the fluttering of the flag, they were able to forget that their bellies were empty, at least part of the time. In April, Animal Farm was proclaimed a republic, and it became necessary to elect a president. There was only one candidate, Napoleon, who was elected unanimously. On the same day, it was given out that fresh documents had been discovered which revealed further details about Snowball's complicity with Jones. It now appeared that Snowball had not, as the animals had previously imagined, merely attempted to lose the Battle of the Cowshed by means of a stratagem, but had o been openly fighting on Jones's side. In fact, it was he who had actually been the leader of the human forces, and had charged into battles with the words, Long live humanity! on his lips. The wounds on Snowball's back, which few of the animals still remembered to have seen, had been inflicted by Napoleon's teeth. In the middle of the summer, Moses the Raven suddenly reappeared on the farm, after an absence of several years. 
He was quite unchanged. He still did no work and talked in the same strain as ever about Sugar Candy Mountain. He would perch on a stump, flap his black wings, and talked by the hour to anyone who would listen. Up there, comrades, he would say solemnly, pointing to the sky with his large beak. Up there, just on the other side of that dark cloud, that you can see, there it lies, Sugar Candy Mountain, that happy country where we poor animals shall rest forever from our labors. He even claimed to have been there on one of his higher flights, and to have seen the everlasting fields of clover and the linseed cake and the lump sugar growing on the hedges. Many of the animals believed him. Their lives now, they reasoned, were hungry and laborious. Was it not right that a better world should exist somewhere else? A thing that was difficult to determine was the attitude of the pigs towards Moses. They all declared contemptuously that his stories about Sugar Candy Mountain were lies, and yet they allowed him to remain on the farm, not working, with an allowance of a gill of beer a day. After his hoof had healed up, Boxer worked harder than ever. Indeed, all the animals worked like slaves that year. Apart from the regular work of the farm and the rebuilding of the windmill, there was the schoolhouse for the young pigs, which was started in March. Sometimes the long hours on insufficient food were hard to bear, but Boxer never faltered. In nothing it, uh, that he said or did was there any sign that his strength was not what it had been. It was only his appearance that was a little altered. His hide was less shiny than it used to be, and his great haunches seemed to have shrunken. The other said, Boxer will pick up when the spring grass comes on. But the spring grass came, and Boxer grew no fatter. Sometimes on the slope leading to the top of the quarry, and when he braced his muscles against the weight of some vast boulder, it seemed that nothing kept him on his feet except the will to continue. At such times his lips were seen to form the words, I will work harder. But he had no voice left. Once again, Clover and Benjamin warned him to take care of his health, but Boxer paid no attention. His twelfth birthday was approaching. He did not care what happened, so long as a good store of stone was accumulated before he went on pension. Late one evening in the summer, a sudden rumor ran around the farm that something had happened to Boxer. He had gone out alone to drag a load of stone down to the windmill, and sure enough, the rumor was true. A few minutes later, two pigeons came racing in with the news. Boxer has fallen. He's lying on his side, and he can't get up. About half of the animals on the farm rushed out to the knoll where the windmill stood. There lay Boxer, between the shafts of the cart, his neck stretched out, unable to, unable to even raise his head. His eyes were glazed, his sides matted with sweat. A thin stream of blood had trickled out of his mouth. Clover dropped to her knees at his side. Boxer, she cried, how are you? It's my lung, said Boxer in a weak voice. It does not matter. I think you will be able to finish the windmill without me. There is a pretty good store of stone accumulated. I had only another month to go in any case. To tell you the truth, I had been looking forward to my retirement. And perhaps, as Benjamin is growing old too, they will let him retire at the same time and be a companion to me. We must get help at once, said Clover. Run, somebody, and tell Squealer what's happened. All the other animals immediately raced back to the farmhouse to give Squealer the news. Only Clover remained, and Benjamin, who lay down at Boxer's side, and without speaking kept the flies off him with his long tail. After about a quarter of an hour, Squealer appeared, full of sympathy and concern. He said that Comrade Napoleon had learned with, his very de with the very deepest distress of this misfortune, and that one of the most loyal workers on the farm was already, sorry, misfortune to one of the most loyal workers on the farm, and was already making arrangements to send Boxer to be treated in the hospital at Willingdon. The animals felt a little uneasy at this, Except for Molly and Snowball, no other animal had ever left the farm. They did not like to think of their sick comrade in the hands of human beings. However, Squealer easily convinced them that the veterinary surgeon in Willingdon could treat Boxer's case with more satisfactorily than could be done on the farm. And about half an hour later, when Boxer had somewhat recovered, he was with, diff uh, he was with difficulty got onto his feet and managed to limp back to his stall, where Clover and Benjamin had prepared a good bed of straw for him. For the next two days, Boxer remained in his stall. The pigs had sent out a large bottle of pink medicine, which they had found in the medicine chest in the bathroom, and Clover administered it to Boxer twice a day after meals. In the evenings, she lay in his stall and talked to him, while Benjamin kept the flies off him. Boxer professed not to be sorry for what had happened. He had made a good recovery, and he might expect to live another three years, and he looked forward to the peaceful days that he could spend in the corner of the big pasture. 
it would be the first time that he had had the leisure to study and improve his mind. He intended, he said, to devote the rest of his life to learning the remaining 22 letters of the alphabet. However, Benjamin and Clover could only be with Boxer after working hours, and it was in the middle of the day when the van came to take him away. The animals were all at work weeding turnips under the supervision of a pig, when they were astonished to see Benjamin come galloping from the direction of the farm buildings, braying at the top of his voice. It was the first time that they had ever seen Benjamin excited. Indeed, it was the first time that anyone had seen him gallop. Quick, quick, he shouted. Come at once. They're taking Boxer away. Without waiting for orders from the pig, the animals broke off work and raced to the farm buildings. Sure enough, there in the yard was a closed, large closed van drawn by two horses with lettering on the side and a sly-looking man in a low-crowned bowler hat sitting on the driver's seat, and Boxer's stall was empty. The animals crowded around the van. Goodbye, Boxer, they chorused. Goodbye. Fools! Fools! shouted Benjamin, prancing around and stamping the earth with his small hooves. Fools! Do you not see what was written on the side of that van? That gave the animals pause, and there was a hush. Muriel began to spell out the words, but Benjamin pushed her aside, and in the midst of the deadly silence he read, Alfred Simmons, horse slaughterer and glue boiler, Willingdon, dealer in hides and bone meal, kennels supplied. Do you not understand what that means? They're taking Boxer to the knackers! A cry of horror burst from the animals. At this moment, the man out of the box whipped the horses, and the van moved out of the yard at a small trot. All the animals followed, crying at the tops of their voices. Clover forced her way to the front. The van began to gather speed. Clover tried to stir her stout limbs to a gallop and achieved a canter. Boxer, she cried. Boxer, boxer, boxer. And just at this moment, as though he had heard the uproar outside, Boxer's face with the white stripe down his nose appeared at the small window at the back of the van. Boxer, cried Clover in a terrible voice. Boxer, get out, get out quickly. They're taking you to your death. All the animals took up the cry of, Get out, Boxer! Get out! But the van was already gathering speed and drawing away from them. It was uncertain whether Boxer had understood what Clover had said. But a moment later, his face disappeared from the window, and there was the sound of a tremendous drumming of hooves inside the van. He was trying to kick his way out. The time had been when a few kicks from Boxer's hooves would have smashed the van to matchwood. But alas, his strength had left him. And in a few moments, the sound of drumming hooves grew fainter and died away. In desperation, the animals began appealing to the two horses which drew the van to stop. Comrades! Comrades! they shouted. Don't take your own brother to his death. But the stupid brutes, too ignorant to realize what was happening, merely set back their ears and quickened their pace. Boxer's face did not reappear at the window. Too late, someone thought of racing ahead and shuttering the five-barred gate. But in another moment, the van was through it and rapidly disappearing down the road. Boxer was never seen again. Three days later, it was announced that he had died in the hospital at Willingdon, in spite of receiving every attention that a horse could have. Squealer came to announce the news to the others. He said, uh, he had, he said, been present during Boxer's last hours. It was mo the most affecting sight I have ever seen, said Squealer, lifting his trotter and wiping away a tear. I was at his bedside at the very last. At the end, almost too weak to speak, he whispered in my ear that his sole sorrow was to have passed on before the windmill was finished. Forward, comrades, he whispered. Forward in the name of the rebellion. Long live Animal Farm. Long live Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon is always right. Those were his very last words, comrades. Here, Squealer's demeanor suddenly changed. He fell silent for a moment, and his little eyes darted suspicious glances from side to side before he proceeded. It had come to his knowledge, he said, that a foolish and wicked rumor had been circulated at the time of Boxer's removal. Some of the animals had noticed that the van which took Boxer away was marked Horse Slaughterer, and it actually jumped to the conclusion that Boxer was being sent to the knackers. It was almost unbelievable, said Squiler, that any animal could be so stupid. Surely, he cried indignantly, whisking his tail and skipping from side to side. Surely they knew that their beloved leader, Comrade Napoleon, better than that. But the explanation was really very simple. The van had previously been in the property of the knacker, and it had been bought by the veterinary surgeon, who had not yet painted the old name out. That was how the mistake had arisen. The animals were enormously relieved to hear this, 
and when Squealer went on to give further graphic details of Boxer's deathbed, the admirable care which he received and the expensive medicines for which Napoleon had paid without a thought to the cost, their last doubts disappeared, and the sorrow that they felt for their comrade's death was tempered by the thought that at least that he had died happy. Napoleon himself appeared at the meeting on the following Sunday morning and pronounced a short oration in Boxer's honor. It had not been possible, he said, to bring back their lamented comrade's remains for internment on the farm, but he had ordered a large wreath to be made from the laurels in the farmhouse garden and set, uh, sent down to be placed on Boxer's grave. And in a few days' time, the pigs intended to hold a memorial banquet in Boxer's honor. Napoleon ended his speech with a reminder of Boxer's two favorite maxims. I will work harder, and Comrade Napoleon is always right. Maxims, he said, which every animal would do well to adopt as his own. On the day appointed for the banquet, the grocer's van drove up from Willingdon and delivered a large wooden crate at the farmhouse. That night there was the sound of uproarious singing, which was followed by what sounded like a violent quarrel and ended at about eleven o'clock with a tremendous crash of glass. No one stirred in the farmhouse before noon on the following day, and word went around from somewhere or other that the pigs had acquired the money to buy themselves another case of whiskey. Chapter 10 Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animals fled. Sorry. The seasons came and went. The short animals' lives fled by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion, except Clover, Benjamin, Moses the Raven, and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher were dead. Jones, too, was dead. He had died in an inebriate's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. Clover was an old stout mare now, stiff in the joints and with a tendency to roomy eyes. She was two years past the retiring age, but in fact no animal had ever actually retired. The talk of setting aside a corner of the pasture for the superannuated animals had long since been dropped. Napoleon was now a mature boar of 24 stone, Squealer was so fat that he could with difficulty see out of his eyes. Only old Benjamin was much the same as ever, except for being a little grayer around the muzzle, and since Boxer's death, more morose and taciturn than ever. There were many more creatures on the farm now, uh, though the increase was not so great as had been expected in the earlier years. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition, passed on by word of mouth, and others had been uh, brought who had never heard mention of such a thing before their arrival. The farm possessed three horses now besides Clover. They were fine, upstanding beasts, willing workers and good comrades, but very stupid. None of them proved able to learn the alphabet beyond the letter B. They accepted everything that they were told about the rebellion and the principles of animalism, especially from Clover, whom they had almost uh, filial respect, but it was doubtful whether they understood very much of it. The farm was more prosperous now, and better organized. It had been enlarged by two fields, which had been bought from Mr. Pilkington. The windmill had been successfully completed at last, and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator of its own, and various new buildings had been added to it. Wimper had bought himself a dog cart. The windmill, however, had not after all been used for generating electrical power. It was used for milling corn, and brought in a handsome money profit. The animals were hard at work building yet another windmill, when that one was finished, so it said, the dynamos would be installed. But the luxuries of which Snowball had once taught the animals to dream, the stalls with electric light and hot and cold water, and three-day week were no longer talked about. Napoleon had denounced such ideas as contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves any richer, except, of course, for the pigs and the dogs. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and so many dogs. It was not that these creatures did not work after their fashion. There was, as Squealer never tired of explaining, endless work in the supervision and organization of the farm. Much of this work was of a kind that other animals were too ignorant to understand. For example, Squealer told them that pigs had to expend enormous labors every day upon mysterious things called files, reports, minutes, and memoranda. These were large sheets of papers which had to be closely covered with writing, and uh, as soon as they were so covered, they were burnt in the furnace. <clears throat> there was the highest importance for the welfare of the farm, Squealer said. 
But still, neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labor, and there were very many of them, and their appetites were always so good. As for the others, their life, so far as they knew, was as it had always been. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they labored in the fields. In winter they were troubled by the cold, and in summer by the flies. Sometimes the older ones among them racked their dim memories and tried to determine whether in the early days of the rebellion, when Jones's expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now. They could not remember. There was nothing which, which, with which they could compare their present lives. They had nothing to go on except Squealer's lists of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. The animals found the problem insoluble. In any case, they had little time for speculating on such things now. Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life and to know that things had never, never had been or never could be much better or much worse, hunger, hardship, and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable law of life. And yet the animals never gave up hope. More, they never lost, even for an instance, their sense of honor and privilege in being members of Animal Farm. They were still the only farm in the whole country, in all England, owned and operated by animals. Not one of them, not even the youngest, not even the newcomers who had been brought from farms 10 or 20 miles away, ever ceased to marvel at that. And when they heard the gun booming and they saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride, and the talk turned away toward the uh, sorry, their talk turned away always towards the old heroic days, the expulsion of Jones, the writing of the seven commandments, and the great battles in which human invaders had been defeated. None of the old dreams had been abandoned. The Republic of Animals, which uh, Major had foretold, when the green fields of England should be untrodden by human feet, was still believed in. Some day it was coming. It might not be soon, it might not be within the lifetime of any animal now living, but still it was coming. Even the tune of Beasts of England was perhaps hummed secretly here and there. At any rate, it was a fact that every animal on the farm knew it, though no one would have dared to sing it aloud. It might be that their lives were hard and not all of their hopes had been fulfilled, but they were conscious that they were uh, not as other animals. If they were hungry, it was not from feeding the tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature among them went upon two legs. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. One day in early summer, Squealer ordered the sheep to follow him and led them out to a piece of waste ground at the other end of the farm, which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep spent the whole day there browsing at the leaves under Squealer's supervision. In the evening, he returned to the farmhouse himself, but, as it was warm weather, told the sheep to stay where they were. It ended by their remaining there the whole week, during which time the other animals saw nothing of them. Squealer was with them for the greater part of every day. He was, he said, teaching them to sing a new song, for which privacy was needed. It was just after the sheep had returned on a pleasant evening, when the animals had finished their work and were making their way back to the farm buildings, that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yard. Startled, the animals stopped in their tracks. It was Clover's voice. She neighed again, and the animals broke into a gallop and rushed into the yard. Then they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig walking on its hind legs. Yes, it was Squealer. A little awkwardly, although not uh, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, but with perfect balance he was strolling across the yard, and a moment later, from out of the door of the farmhouse, came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some did it better than others. One or two were even a trifle unsteady and looked as though they would have liked the support of a stick, but every one of them made his way around the yard successfully. And finally there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the black cockerel, and out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambling around him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly around the yard, as though the world had been turned upside down. Then there came a moment when the first shock had worn off, and when in spite of everything, in spite of their terror of the dogs, and of the habit developed through the long years of never complaining, never criticizing, no matter what happened, they just might have uttered some word of protest. 
But just at that moment, as though at a signal, all the sheep burst out into a tremendous bleeding of four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. It went on for five minutes without stopping. And by the time the sheep had quieted down, the chance to utter any protest had passed, for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. Her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mane and led him around to the end of the big barn, where the Seven Commandments were written. For a minute or two, they stood gazing at the tarred wall with its white lettering. My sight is failing, she said finally. Even when I was young, I could not have read what was written there. But it appears to me that the wall looks different. Are the Seven Commandments the same as they used to be, Benjamin? For once, Benjamin consented to break his rule, and he read aloud to her what was written on the wall. There was nothing there now except a single commandment. It ran, Some animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Sorry, I screwed up the list. And after that, it did not seem strange when the next day the pigs who were supervising the work of the farm all carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set or arranging to install a telephone and had taken out subscriptions to John Bull, Tidbits, and the Daily Mirror. It did not seem strange when Napoleon was seen strolling the farmhouse garden with a pipe in his mouth. No, not even when the pigs took Mr. Jones's clothes out of the wardrobes and put them on. Mr. Napoleon himself appearing in a black coat, rat catcher breeches, and leather leggings, while his favorite sow appeared in the watered silk dress which Mrs. Jones had been used, had, had been used to wear on Sundays. A week later in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighboring farmers had been invited to make a tour inspection. They were shown all over the farm and expressed great admiration for everything that they saw, especially the windmill. The animals were weeding the turnip field. They worked diligently, hardly raising their faces from the ground and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or the human visitors. That evening, loud laughter and bursts of singing came from the farmhouse, and suddenly, at the sound of the mangled, mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. What could be happening in there? now that for the first time animals and human beings were meeting on terms of equality. With one accord, they began to creep as quietly as possible into the farmhouse garden. At the gate they paused, half frightened to go on, but Clover led the way in. They tiptoed up to the house, and such animals as were tall enough peered in through the dining room window. There, around the long table, sat a half-dozen farmers and a half-dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself occupying the seat of honor at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. Their company had been enjoying the game of cards, but had broken off for the moment, evidently in order to drink a toast. A large jug was circulating, and the mugs were being refilled with beer. No one noticed the wondering, uh, the wondering faces of the animals that gazed in at the window. Mr. Pilkington of Foxwood had stood up, his mug in his hand, in a moment, he said, he would ask the present company to drink a toast, but before doing so, there were a few words that he felt incumbent upon him to say. It was a source of great satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure to all other presents, to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had come to an end. There had been a time, not that he or any of the present company had shared such sentiments, but there had been a time when the respective proprietors of Animal Farm had been regarded, he would not say with hostility, but perhaps with a certain measure of misgiving by their human neighbors. Unfortunate incidents occurred. Mistaken ideas had been current. It had been felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal and was liable to have an unsettling effect in the neighborhood. Too many farmers had assumed, without due inquiry, that on such a farm a spirit of license and indiscipline would prevail. They had been nervous about the effects upon their own animals or even upon their human employees. But all such doubts were now dispelled. Today, he and his friends had visited Animal Farm and inspected every inch of it with their own eyes. And what did they find? Not only the most up-to-date methods, but a discipline and orderliness which should be an example to all farmers everywhere. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the country. 
Indeed, he and his fellow visitors today had observed many features that they intended to introduce on their own farms immediately. He would end his remarks, he said, by emphasizing once again the friendly feelings that subsisted and ought to subsist between Animal Farm and its neighbors. Between pigs and human beings, there was not and there need not be any clash of interests whatsoever. Their struggles and their difficulties were one. Was not the labor problem the same everywhere? Here it became apparent that Mr. Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company, but for a moment he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. After much choking, during which his various chins turned purple, he managed to get it out. If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. This balmo sat the table in a roar, and Mr. Pilkington once again congratulated the pigs on the low rations, the long working hours, and the general absence of pampering which they had observed on Animal Farm. And now, he said finally, he would ask the company to raise to their feet and make certain their glasses were full. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington, gentlemen, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. There was enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Napoleon was so gratified that uh, he left his place and came around the table to clink his mug against Mr. Pilkington's before emptying it. When the cheering had died down, Napoleon, who had remained on his feet, intimated that he too had a few words to say. Like all of Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He too, he said, was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. For a long time there had been rumors, circulated, he had reason to think, by some malignant enemy, that there was something subversive or even revolutionary in the outlook of himself and his colleagues. They had been credited with attempting to stir up rebellion among the animals on neighboring farms. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their sole wish, now and in the past, was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbors. This farm, which he had the honor to control, he added, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds, which were in his own possession, were owned by the pigs jointly. He did not believe, he said, that any of the old suspicions still lingered, but certain changes had been made recently in the routine of the farm, which should have the effect of promoting confidence still further. Hitherto, the animals on the farm had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade. This was to be suppressed. There had also been a very strange custom, whose origin was unknown, of marching every Sunday morning past a boar's skull which was nailed to a post in the garden. This too would be suppressed, and the skull had already been buried. His visitors might have observed too that the green flag which flew from the masthead. Uh, sorry, his visitors might have observed too the green flag which flew from the masthead. If so, they would perhaps have noted that the white hoof and horn with which it had been previously marked had now been removed. It would be a plain green flag from now onwards. He had only one criticism, he said, to make of Mr. Pilkington's excellent and neighborly speech. Mr. Pilkington had referred throughout to Animal Farm. He could not, of course, know, for he, Napoleon, was only now, for the first time announcing it, that the name Animal Farm had been abolished. Henceforth, the farm was to be known as the Manor Farm, which he believed was the correct and original name. Gentlemen, concluded Napoleon, I give you the same toast as before, but from in a different form. Fill your glasses to the brim. Gentlemen, here is my toast. To the prosperity of the manor farm. There was some hearty cheering as before, and the mugs were emptied to the dregs. But as the animals outside gazed at the scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that had altered the faces of the pigs? Clover's old dim eyes flittered from one face to another. Some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three. But what was it that seeming to be melting and changing? Then the applause having come to an end, the company took up their cards and continued the game that had been interrupted, and the animals crept silently away. But they had not gone twenty yards when they stopped short, an uproar of voices coming from the farm, uh, farmhouse. They rushed back and looked through the window again. Yes, a violent quarrel was in progress. There were shoutings, bangings on the table, sharp suspicious glances, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr. Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which.
So that has been George Orwell's Animal Farm. Um, I don't know how many people are watching right now, but was there anybody here who had not read that story before, assuming you want to participate inside of chat? We can discuss the book a little bit. Oh, great. Um, I will make sure that there's a VOD of this up uh, later, Kite, because I, um, I know you came in partway through, I think. Uh, what did you think of the story, if you don't mind me asking? I can say a couple of other things about the... So um, just in case there's... Um, I know lurking's a big thing. Oh, Rasmus, it's been 80 years and Marx is still fighting about it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's a few questions that I can ask too, um, for, uh, people. So for instance, um, has anybody read the preface that George Orwell wrote for this? Cause it's usually not included in the published versions of the book. Um, and then, um, the other detail that I can talk about is that there is um oh cool sorry I just got a nice message um in telegame if you're kicking around I just saw your discord messages I'll get back to that a little bit later um but there's also okay so actually here's maybe the question to ask because again like the one problem with this is that I don't want people to feel like they have to talk if they don't want, but it also kind of strikes me as really annoying if I just um, monologue about the book, um, because this is obviously a very well... Okay, actually, no, it's not an obviously well-known book. The biggest reason why I wanted to read this was a number of people had mentioned that they were not familiar with 1984 or Animal Farm, and some people had not heard of who George Orwell was. Um, and this is actually going to be sort of a start to a few things that I do on stream. But, um, you know, the one thing I didn't really want to do was just turn it into a big monologue about, um, the stuff that I'm, you know, the stuff that I'm reading or that, um, uh, ahead of time. I don't mind monologuing, but again, like there's just something kind of, I don't know, kind of wanky if I just like do my own impromptu essay on on Animal Farm because it is something that um, for some people at least is something they need to do in school. Uh, okay, so when you first jumped in, you thought you were doing some form of riddle, so you're like, oh man, I'm not going to get it, but I enjoyed overall the story. Yeah, no problem. Kai. Yeah, and again, I don't want to draw people out um, into the chat, but there's a few details I'll maybe mention that people may or may not know about Animal Farm. So number one, I highly recommend checking this out, and I'll, I'll find a source for it for a future broadcast. There is a an essay that uh, George Orwell wrote for Animal Farm, which was not published. Well, obviously, it's later been published because I've read it. But uh, so far as I can tell, it is not included in the published versions of Animal Farm. And it was not included in the original publication of Animal Farm. And a lot of it was actually on the difficulty of getting the story published. Uh, what the essay is largely about, I will cover it at a later point, but what the essay is largely about is this resistance that he ran into, which was there was a general spirit in England that you shouldn't annoy the USSR. And so, you know, there's this idea, it's like, well, you can't make, you know, you can't make them say comrade to each other. And, you know, pigs are kind of offensive to connect them to. Um, and just this general feeling that there was a very uncritical view of um, the Soviet Union and Stalin in particular that made the book unpublishable. And he makes the point that the Ministry of Information, like there was no specific government effort to suppress the work, but instead there is this collection of ideas that you just simply do not talk about and that it is far more um, it's it's very effective and it doesn't raise the kind of worry that people have when you hear about more formal forms of censorship. So we'll talk about 1984 another time, but there is a very common um, comparison that people make between 1984 and A Brave New World. And they say that A Brave New World, and Huxley actually um, wrote to Orwell 
talking about 1984 and said that um, a a state like that would not waste resources in violently suppressing its population because gentler means would be more effective. And I think the one child, and this is a very common comparison that gets made with 1984. And one thing is, I think 1984 is also about more things than just the violence. But I think the really important thing is, is that if you have read Orwell's introduction to Animal Farm. Um, I find it very difficult to believe that he is not aware of this fact. Uh, in fact, I would argue that probably that introduction is very much stating the kind of position that people like to sort of do inside of the contrast with um, with 1984. Oh, Isaacson, I read this as a teenager and it really turned you, as your aunt said, into a hippie liberal. It was eye-opening to the state of your country. That's really interesting. So this brings me to the other detail about this one. So if you, again, uh, in a future broadcast, I'll try and, I'll try and handle the, the um, introduction. Um, Oh, Animal Farm and 1984 are pretty similar, and it is fun to read C.S. Lewis's review comparing them. Uh, it was also not a surprise to you that C.S. Lewis liked Animal Farm better. Yeah, it's I, <laughs> that's no doubt there. Um, I did not know that C.S. Lewis wrote on the comparisons between the two. That is one I definitely need to look up because I've I've read a few of sort of the maybe the lesser the lesser known um, C.S. Lewis works. So I have I've read the. Okay, I don't remember the title, though. I think The Invention of Love. Anyways, it's like the the big essay that he wrote, like the, the more scholarly one. And I like the screw tape leather, letters. That one's probably better known. Um, but I didn't realize that he did the comparison between the the two um, the two really famous Orwell satires. Um, but to Eyes of Sin's point, there's another detail. So uh, I'll ask a question. Again, it's nice to do it as a question, but please don't feel that there's a need for... Um, interaction if if you don't want to uh has anybody here seen or at least knows of the animated film because there is a there is a cartoon version of um animal farm i think it was made in the 1950s i think like 1954 i'll, I'll find the exact date for it yeah no worries uh kite there's not not too much that was missed um i should actually ask too if there's any plot details that aren't clear to you um, from the start, uh, I can try and fill those in, but right now I'm just checking to see if anybody's familiar with the animated. You've seen a couple of adaptations. There was a live action one, and then I had no idea there was a live action one. It's like the anti babe. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is kind of crazy, <laughs> but. Um, okay, interesting. Um, so it was 1954. So there's two detail. Yeah, yeah. So Erasmus got it. Yeah, the the animated one was funded by the CIA um, as an anti an anti Soviet film. It's why the ending for the animated film is very different. The, the ending of the animated film... So there's some liberties they take with the story, and they are largely consistent with the sort of thing you will see in any uh, adaptation. So characters are kind of condensed because it's easier to draw fewer characters than it is sort of an ensemble cast. Um, certain events are sort of combined. So there's there's... Um, there are two sort of conflicts, but there are certain details about the fights that are sort of blended together. Um, the details about their... So um, Whimper is sort of left as this one um, interaction with the outside world that isn't completely hostile. I think Whimper also owns the... Um, the uh, the knack is also like owns the Knackers. Um, but like the whole idea of having like the two neighboring farms that are, are sort of threats, that's not really present. The film's about an hour long. So it took me, I think about three hours to read this. Um, but the ending, and it, it, this comes as no surprise if you know that the CIA financed it. Um, but the, um, the ending is the revelation that's the same at the end of, of, um, the book, <clears throat> 
but Benjamin leads a second revolution. And the narration really lays it on thick, where it's like, you know, <laughs> it's inevitable that in these kinds of countries where, you know, the, the claims of equality have been have been overrun by these these greedy individuals that the people will need to rise up again. Like it's it, as soon as you have that lens, you totally see what they're doing. Um, it is kind of funny. So far as I can tell, nobody who was working on the, the, um, the film um, knew it was uh, CIA money. Cause again, this is sort of something that the CIA was financing, right? Like sort of works of art to, try and act as as these propaganda pieces. Um, but the other detail that I found was um, the individual who is sent by the CIA to get the rights from Orwell's widow was Howard Hunt, who is a name, if you know anything about the Watergate scandal that brought down Richard Nixon's presidency. <laughs> He's one of the people who I, I believe he was charged and convicted. Yeah, Erasmus. It's a, just this weirdest little deal. This is the sort of stuff you'd expect to see in like an Assassin's Creed story. <laughs> but so far as I can tell, this is a matter of public record. Like, again, I haven't, I haven't looked into carefully. And like, that's, that's almost like a, it's almost a detail that's too good to check. But I, I believe it is a matter of public record that he uh, obtained the rights for the what ultimately became the uh, animated adaptation of Animal Farm. Um, to uh, maybe it's in his memoir. Well, actually, if it's in his memoir, I think there's um, some questions about the authenticity of that. But yeah, anyways. Um, so far as I can tell, he he is the one who was sent to obtain the rights. So. Uh, an absolutely preposterous real world connection that if you wrote that in a book, nobody would believe you. But of course, now we have to, you know, we, we just have to accept it for, for its, its madness. That's great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, um, one thing I might have done at the start, especially because I was talking about the um, one of the things I was kind of talking about at the start of the the reading. And again, as always, if you guys would like more of this stuff, please let me know. Uh, this is definitely something that I'm interested in doing more of. Um, but I probably could have taken some time to talk about um, George Orwell, his life. Um, it is worth remembering. This is a pretty so. This is a a pretty clear uh, attack on specifically the Soviet Union, right? Um, so it might surprise some of you to know that the author of this is actually a socialist, um, and in fact, he was so committed to the project of socialism that he went and fought in Spain on the side of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. And for those of you that don't know what the Spanish Civil War is, um, for a little, if I had to give it a sentence, I would say. It's the dress rehearsal for World War II, in which uh, there was sort of a, a fascist coup in the country. There was a, a fascist faction. There was a, um, a socialist faction, anarchist, uh, you know, left versus right, I suppose. Um, both Italy and Germany um, supplied the, the right wing side, uh, the Soviet Union um, supplied the left. Uh, ultimately the the nationalists the fascists won um in fact franco so far i think he ran spain until the 1970s <clears throat> but and i i will admit i don't know that many details about orwell fighting in spain but i believe he got a bit of a preview of, of what would become stalinism uh i have heard at least in one place that he was potentially on a list of people to be taken out um, by certain fra factions inside the the Republican side. Um, but this is one of the things that actually, so you've noticed that I've, I've brought up Orwell a few times uh, over the last couple of streams. And one, it's because this is the inauguration of something that I'm going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm hoping um, you're into it. But I think one of the really admirable parts of George Orwell is that he is somebody who had some very clear ideas and was very clearly committed to a number of things. But that did not stop him from being able to write what he thought was true and what needed to be said. 
at his time, it was not necessarily popular to criticize the ally, the Soviet Union. And this would be something that, in his particular case, is a cause that he might be more aligned with. But that did not necessarily stop him from uh, directing his attention and his criticism towards um, what was a, a very big threat. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I really admire his essays and his satires. I do like satire. Uh, I am a huge fan of it. Definitely. Yeah. Complicated is the better way of putting it. <laughs> um, I am a very big fan of his writing. Um, I'm also a very big fan of Jonathan Swift. Um, so you know, those of you who've read Gulliver's Travels, you've probably read uh, An Animal Farm and you'll, you'll certainly see the similarities there. But what I did want to um, start up, and again, I'm happy to talk about Animal Farm um, a little bit more, but this is a sort of a preview, or not a preview, but this is sort of setting the table for something. And I'm going to be playing, I'm going to be changing my regular schedule for the next little while, and we are going to be playing a game which is coming out of its early access release on the 25th. So I'm going to be playing that on Wednesday. And here is its trailer. What a wild ride this has been. That could be catastrophic. The catastrophe is that they're succeeding. Listen, now, I know you've only come in to clean up the place, but I've got a bit caught up. You're going to have to run the news tonight. But today is day one of a new future. Nothing, Jeremy. We're still vassal slaves. We're just in prettier cages. Very own Patrick Bannon live at the first. Oh my goodness, that must have been quite a shock. Hello, Mr. Bannon. Hello. So Not For Broadcast is out of early access as of Wednesday, and that is going to be what we're playing for the next little while. I have not uh, played it all the way through. In fact, I don't believe all of the uh, essays are out there. I'm actually not a big Mal... I've read a couple of Malcolm Gladwell's books, but I, I don't really... <laughs> I like satire. <laughs> I don't really care about it. It's like Papers, Please meets Five Nights at Freddy's meets the quiz broadcast, I guess. It looks... It is... This is... Uh, the bits I have seen of this and the bits I have played, this is a really good game. And this is going to be sort of what I'm going to try and do. There's a couple of other games that I've got lined up, and my intention is to do some more reading as well. But in this particular case here, with uh, and your your connections to most of this stuff is pretty much pretty much there. So hopefully you get a chance to see this Erasmus because this might be up your alley. But one of the really important things to remember here is that you, especially with good games, you can enjoy them in their own right. Um, you can enjoy not for broadcast and not be aware of um, any of Orwell's works. Orwell's not the only person who's talked about uh, what you can and can't say or has talked about totalitarianism or sort of the you know propaganda or, or any of these <clears throat> any of these topics that that probably he's best known for. Um, but there's a few people, in fact, one person who kind of comes to mind right now is IntelliGame, um, who is going to take the time and not just play the game, but engage with it at a deeper, deeper level and either talk about the context in which these, you know, these games are made or the topics that they're covering. And I think one of the big things for me is that I like like I like reading and I like playing games and one of the things that gives me a tremendous amount of enjoyment is to be able to see how these things connect with each other. It's not just a question of finding uh, clever little references. In fact, 
I read a review of this game, which I thought was a very poor review, and it was clear that the reviewer did not think that this game made them feel smart enough, that they wanted some really overt uh, signposts to present-day political figures that... Um, you know, would make sure that they were they were among the elect, that they are one of the you know intelligentsia who who's perfectly aware of which, you know, which coded reference to which politician is is in place there. Um, I will tell you for sure that this game does have uh, pretty overt references to Orwell's work. What I think is a more rewarding way to engage with these is not just you know pick up the references or whatever, but to specifically see how it folds into a broader conversation. Does it have something new to say? Is, are we rediscovering something that, you know, maybe had been forgotten? Is it able to kind of take something that was uh, written or said before and put an interesting spin on it? Obviously, games are interactive. Uh, books are not the sort of thing that you can interrogate. And for a game that has so much full motion video, you sort of want there to be this degree of sort of back and forth. You want to see whether or not you're actually um, shifting things. And so, um, again, to me, I was a little sad when I discovered how little familiarity there was with Orwell. And, I mean, it, it's pushing against the tide, right? Uh, to a certain extent, you are going to have people who want to watch Twitch. And that is going to involve watching a game. And maybe you want to interact with a streamer. But very often it doesn't involve necessarily wanting to be lectured to or it doesn't involve wanting an audiobook. You know, if any of you wanted to hear Animal Farm, you could have gone on any number of services and and gotten a copy of that there. But so far as I can, because this there's going to be a bunch of people playing this game when it comes out on Wednesday, um, the very least that I can do is share my little bit to say, here's somebody who said some interesting things and at least now, uh, if you're interested in, engage, in engaging with this um, game in a slightly more deep, deeper level, and more importantly, not just taking my word for it, but seeing what you see on the screen and specifically decisions that I make, and think about them in the context of what we've talked about before, I'd like to think that that leads people to enjoy games even more, right? You already have the base enjoyment out of a well-made game, and what you're gaining instead is this broader appreciation of how this has been discussed uh, earlier. You know, again, I have my option. I could have read John Milton's Arapagetica if I wanted to kind of talk about, <clears throat> you know, freedom of speech and such. Um, but in this case here, I thought Animal Farm was both a good choice for a story more importantly, too, right, you can already see inside of this game here, right, there's a new party that's come into power. Um, you are in kind of a, a degree, you have a certain degree of power yourself in terms of deciding what gets put on the screen and whether or not you will follow the dictates of this particular party if they ask you to do something. Um, and so it seemed to me that in this particular case here, um, you know, Animal Farm was as good of a choice as any to open that uh, discussion. And before I play the game on Wednesday, we'll have a little discussion ahead of that. But I think it's probably time for me to wrap up. I'm sorry that there was a little bit less um, exchange, but before I sign off for the evening, I guess I just wanted to leave the conversation open, particularly if you had not read Animal Farm before. And again, Kite, I appreciate you, uh, you know, chatting. Uh, Eyes of Sin, I appreciate you hanging out and mentioning your experience with Animal Farm before. I, you and I definitely have to ch chat about this book a little bit more, but I hope, I hope you enjoyed hearing it again. And Erasmus, of course, I can always rely on on making me kind of have to guard my words a little bit just in case I say something outrageous because I, I have a feeling Erasmus is very well equipped to, um, you know, make put me set me straight if I. Uh, if I step out of, well, sorry, if I if I say something untrue. But I particularly do appreciate all of you hanging out. Like I said, this is something weird and interesting. Um, and I'm hoping that it pays off when I wind up playing this other game. Um, but as always, I, I want to give people a chance to um, to talk. Um, because particularly with me, it's it's very easy for me to just get used to hearing my, my own things. You said you missed most of this now? Oh, I'm, well, don't worry, Ed Baver. So... I will make sure that I have a VOD ready to go before um, before uh, like it 
falls off of Twitch, but the Twitch one will be available for two weeks. So if you want, you can definitely find this on my on my channel. It shouldn't be that difficult to, to find. And again, you know, we you can always hang out. I will encourage you, for those of you who like this kind of discussion and this kind of reading, I, I will commit to try and be as close to my regular start time, seven o'clock for Wednesday. Uh, if you want to come in for that early stuff and I will announce on Twitter if I'm going to be late, but um, yeah, you can't wait to hear the beginning. Yeah, yeah, great. So actually here, um, tell you what, I will, um, just in case there's any confusion on this, I will make it easy for people to find where this Where this stuff is. Um, this should do. Okay. Hopefully there's nothing too outrageous on the screen. But um, if you go to my page, so first of all, if you want to hear what was going while the stream is going live, you can actually click on the recent broadcast as it currently is. You can actually rewind to hear stuff that I've said before. I don't think it updates in real time. So eventually you're going to hit the end and it's going to seem like the sentence ends um, sort of abruptly. Um, but you can also just click on videos if you do view all on recent broadcasts. Uh, and then there's also a section for highlights and uploads, but that's not necessarily going to, um, that's not necessarily going to, uh, you know, um, that's not necessarily going to give you the stuff that we're looking for just under recent broadcasts, view all, and, um, you're, you're ready, ready to go here. And this will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, I am a little bit behind on a few of my my old episodes in that, but particularly, like if you would like the enhancement that's going to come, and and you know what Orwell is going to provide to uh, not for broadcast, um, I definitely recommend that you. I you, first of all, you can read the book yourself, but if you like to hear me read it, um, imperfections and all, uh, you can click on the VOD. That's going to be available you know, between now and when we're ready to go. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm told that this is stuff that's pretty decent for work. But anyways, uh, I am making this a long goodbye. Um, for all this stuff, if you find it useful or if it's not quite for you, I definitely appreciate feedback. So you can even send it privately if you want. Um, but I noticed that a good friend of mine, Johnny Big Time, is still streaming. Night Valian is as well. Um, but I'm going to host Johnny Big Time because I don't always get a chance to do that. He's got a really great, he's got a very active um, and, and very gregarious kind of personality. Definitely a little bit more high action, high impact. He's playing Marvel Spider-Man so that he can move on to um, Miles Morales. Johnny's a really friendly guy, somebody I've known for a while on stream, uh, on Twitch. And uh, I think he's, uh, he's, he's definitely a very natural entertainer. And so I think, I mean, he's already in, he's doing well. He's got uh, almost 20 people watching him already. Um, but I don't think the numbers should be the thing that keep uh, driving us through everything. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for those of you who stuck around and supported me on this weird little experiment. I really, really hope that you enjoy the stuff on Wednesday moving forward. Um, and there will be another reading coming up, but let's save that for another time. Treat Johnny well. I'll see some of you on Wednesday. Until then.